working. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to Angular Connect. I hope you've had a really Woo! great day morning. yesterday. We, right. Whoa, we're losing our cameraman already. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to see right. you've all made it back in. After Particularly the ones after the bar crawl. That was... Went on a little later than we expected. Right, okay, so yesterday was such a great day. I had an amazing time. I really hope you all did too. Uh, we've got a few photographs, wildlife photographers, Igor in the wild, just there. And um, uh, we had some really amazing talks, actually. I think some of the best talks we've ever, ever had here. Also, Expert Zones, I thought, were really great. We got some really Some of our youngest Angular well. Connect members. Yeah, <laughs> and the mini workshops, really great feedback. So I hope you all got a chance to experience all of those things. But it was, I think, a really awesome day. Um, so don't forget, we've got uh, prizes for tweets at the end of today. We've also, we did really well yesterday on the hashtag Angular Connect, so keep it coming, hashtag Angular Connect, get on Twitter. Um, so um, you might have noticed that our theme is uh, under the sea, um, but we thought we could love, double down and make this even better. So uh, last night uh, we went out to Woolworths and bought ourselves a small blow-up turtle that we just popped outside the front. I don't know if anyone noticed it on the way in. Now, I have to admit, this is not, nothing to do with us, although they're really on brand, aren't they? It's fantastic. This is actually for the climate march that's going to go on today. So um, uh, if you see them, you can wave to them and tell them that we're also very sustainable as well. Uh, just to be serious, I, I think uh, we've done a fantastic job. Everyone has been wonderful. We've all kept to the code of conduct, so let's keep it up today. If you do have a problem, find uh, one of the green staff members or just get in touch with Megan. But I think we're good there. Thank you. So I'm really enjoying our new expert zones, and I'm hopefully you guys are too. So if you haven't had um, a chance yet, go and take um, a look downstairs. We've got another couple running today. And we also have a couple of mini workshops. And again, if you want to attend those, take a look at the website to find out more information. And don't forget, uh, we had a fantastic community lunch yesterday. The feedback was really good. If you'd like to um, get involved in the diversity lunch today, it's downstairs in the mini workshop room. Uh, we'll have food stations in there, so you don't need to get your food beforehand. And uh, this morning, we're starting off our mindfulness sessions. Uh, that, those are in the quiet room. Uh, I think they kick off around about 10.45. So if you want to just chill, get down there. OK, so it's time for another Slido poll. So everybody, phones out again. Head on over to slido.com. The event code is Angular Connect. You all know this now. You're masters at this. So the question is, what is your favorite operating system? We're going to try and get the results on one of these screens, see when they start coming in. Oh, look at that. That was quick. We're getting good at this, everybody. This is great. Mac 45, we thought this might be the case. Come on, MS-DOS. Come on. Go on. <laughs> yeah, MS yes. Yeah, OK. Well, Steve Jobs will be Ooh. happy. Windows is creeping up. On, this is Windows. interesting. No, no more Windows. Well, there we go. That's actually, I thought Mac was going to win by more than that, personally. So it's good to see a good If we add MS-DOS to Windows, then maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so now you're on Slido. It's the perfect opportunity to start uh, asking, the ang uh, asking the Angular panel questions. So later today, we're going to get uh, almost all the Google team up here to answer some of your questions. And you can submit questions now through Slido. So before we get on with the keynote, we still have to thank our wonderful sponsors, AG Grid, our premier sponsor, and all our other wonderful ones. Uh, we simply just couldn't do this event without them. If you haven't had a chance yet, the sponsor booths are outside here, and you should go and uh, spend some time there. And I think it's time to get on. So. Um, our keynote this morning is with the wonderful Minko. He joined the Google team just over a year ago. Uh, before that, he was doing some fantastic work with static analysis tools and was very well known in the community for doing that. Uh, now he's a developer advocate at Google, and uh, he's going to come and tell us a little bit more about what's been happening uh, on that side of things. So let's put our hands together and welcome Minko onto stage. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Minko Getchev. I'm a senior engineer in the Angular team at Google. I'm truly excited to be here today. This is my first Angular Connect as part of the Angular team. I've been here about five years ago where I talked about aspect-oriented programming, and today we're going to discuss a couple of other topics. We're going to primarily focus on performance and tooling, but we're also going to mention the Angular's involvement 
in pushing the web forward with web standards. So let us get started. The agenda for today, as I mentioned, we're going to discuss Angular, Angular uh, the web platform, and our efforts in the standardization, our connection with this 39 and W3C. We're also going to discuss automating the development experience by using schematics, enabling best practices, enabling extensibility with the new Builders API. We're going to look at some specific examples. And finally, we're going to discuss Bazel and how you can build at scale. Very quick disclaimer before I keep going. So I'm in uh, the process of losing my voice. So if you stop hearing me at some point, it's probably not going to be a technical problem. Cool. So uh, let us get started with TC39 and W3C first. Often when I talk to developers, it seems that people have the impression that we're working in isolation without collaborating with the other parties involved in moving the web platform forward. That's not quite the case. We have regular syncs with both TC39 and W3C. In fact, we were one of the initiators uh, who pushed decorators forward, the original proposals for decorators that uh, you're currently, in fact, using. And we're currently working with TC39 on providing the best, the most optimal for the JavaScript virtual machine, and at the same time, ergonomic API that is going to allow you to uh, use decorators efficiently in the browser. So currently, very active in the standardization process are the different browser vendors. We have Internet Explorer, we have Chrome, Firefox. All of them are trying to contribute to the web platform by providing more ergonomic APIs, more expressive APIs, so we can build more powerful and uh, delightful user experiences. One of these browsers is, in fact, developed in the company where Angular comes from. This is Chrome. And luckily, we have a lot of intersection points with Chrome. So we're in a constant collaboration around how we can make the web faster, how we can provide more rich user, inter user experiences, and much more. I was just keying through the meetings now that we had over the past a couple of months. And we have been discussing how to make powerful PWAs. We discussed web performance, web standards, testing, and much more. In fact, one of the recent uh, deliverables that uh, we worked on together is web.dev slash Angular. In this set of posts, we are trying to help you to provide you uh, guidelines on how to build performance and progressive Angular web applications. This collection of posts contains information about how to build performant web applications in terms of improving the time to interactive as well as the speeds of the Angular change detection, respectively runtime performance. We're discussing how to build more reliable applications by using pre-caching with the Angular service worker, how to make the applications installable and accessible. All the posts are in the same format. You have a bunch of content, uh, interactive examples in stack blitz, and some diagrams to help you get started faster. If you're particularly interested in performance, I would definitely recommend you to visit the performance optimizations in Angular by Merck today. And if you're interested in the internals of Angular and the work that we have been doing there, definitely visit Kara's talk on how Angular works. All right, now let's talk about tooling. We have been working on making schematics the default standard for transformating and uh, transforming the files in your workspace and bootstrapping your projects. In fact, schematics can help us build more performant applications as well by automating your development experience by helping you to, to follow best practices easier. Adios Mani is publishing a regular survey on the cost of JavaScript. He did it for 2019 as well, and well, still the most expensive asset that we are shipping over the wire is JavaScript. So definitely we would want to reduce the number of bytes that we're shipping during the initial application load time in order to speed up time to interactive. Probably the most efficient way to do that is by using route level code splitting. I bet most of you are familiar with this concept. You can use just load children in the Angular route declaration, and from there you can just load a particular route that is not going to be used immediately lazy. However, this involves, creating, uh, this involves a lot of manual steps. 
we will first have to define an ng module. We have to declare a lazy route. We have to declare a route in the ng module that is being handled by a component. And if we're following the Angular style guide, on top of that, we also have to deliver a routing module. That's a lot of steps that could be automated by using schematics. So in Angular CLI version 8.1, we introduced a command that is going to allow you to generate a lazy route with just a couple of characters. Basically, you can specify your module name. You can, spe you can specify the path that you want this module to handle and your parent module. Let me show you how this works. So here we have an Angular application with a couple of routes. When we navigate to the about route, we can see that we have zero network activity. So there is absolutely nothing being lazily loaded in this particular case. If we want to move this route to a lazy route, what we can do is just go to the console, type ng-generate module, the name of the module, the name of the route that it is going to handle, and the name of the parent module. From here, you can see that we generated a new component, new module, and also altered the app module. Here is the lazy route that we introduced. Just a traditional standard lazy route. And now we can get rid of the eager route because it is no longer necessary for us to use. Finally, in order to move the functionality out of our eagerly loaded about component, we can just copy and paste this content to the lazily uh, loaded one. And everything from there on should work automatically. Now, when we go back to Chrome, and uh, we navigate to the About page, we can notice that the browser has sent an additional HTTP request over the network to download the About module, and from there, bootstrap the About page. All right, so this is just one of the examples of how we can automate the user experience by using schematics. We have been already applying schematics for ng-add, ng-updates to automate your migrations, and uh, many others, including bootstrapping your workspace. But schematics can also help us to build more intelligent tooling. Schematics with combination with some constraints that we're setting on top of the application structure, so we can extract some metadata about it by statically analyzing it. Now, in order to look at the next example, let us first try to use the application with the lazy route that we just introduced over a very slow network. Now, if we have a very heavy network latency and we navigate to the About page, you can notice that, well, the user may have to wait quite some time until they actually see the result. And we're putting so much effort in order to deliver desktop-like experiences in the web by introducing all this complexity of state management, progressively loading the application, and at the same time, we deliver pretty poor UX, right? In order to handle this issue, we can use preloading. So while the user was in the home page, we can just load in the background the about, the about module so that when the user performs the navigation, it could be instant. There are different ways to do that. We can preload only the modules associated with visible links. This is the so-called quick link strategy. We can preload only the modules that are associated with links that we have hovered over. Or we can apply probably the most advanced strategy out there, predictive prefetching where we're going to fetch only the modules that are likely to be needed next based on statistic report how users are actually interacting with our application. So this here, the tool that I'm going to talk about, it is more of a community-driven tool. This is something that uh, in spare time we have been collaborating with uh, Chrome, so it is not an official Angular project. But it provides a really good example of how by combining different Google services, we can provide more delightful user experience. This is the tool called GuestJS, and let us just introduce to our tiny example. First, we're going to use NGX Build Plus. This is another extension built by community which allows you to plug into the Webpack configuration of your application without ejecting. After that, we can just edit the extra Webpack configuration that we want to alter our build with and introduce the guest plugin there. All we need to specify is a Google Analytics ID, a period for which we would want to extract a report for, and a route provider. This is something that we're going to specifically discuss in a little bit. Now, we can quit Vim 
and build our application by specifying the extra webpack configuration. And this is going to trigger the build process that we're all familiar with. Specifically here, we're going to compile TypeScript. Uh, we're going to concatenate a couple of our files and run the guest plugin that is going to require access to our Google Analytics report. Once uh, we provide read access to guest.js, it is going to build our application and introduce preloading or prefetching instructions inside of the individual bundles. We have been collaborating with the Google Chrome team, specifically with Adios Money from there, and with the TensorFlow team in order to make sure that the model provides the most, the biggest accuracy possible. So next, we can just serve the application and open it in our favorite browser. And uh, just uh, to verify that the prefetching is happening in the right order, we can look at the network tab and see that the about module and the NAND module have been prefetched. Uh, in the order specified in GuestJS, depending on the likelihood for them to be used. So how GuestJS works? It is just going to use a report from your Google Analytics. Uh, it is going to use a report from Google Analytics. After that, it is going to statically analyze your routing structure. This is only possible because of the constraints that we have set on how you can declare your routes in order to make them statically analyzable. These constraints sometimes help us provide better tooling for you. For example, types, set another type of constraints. That could be quite useful. After that, we built a machine learning model which could be either a Markov chain or a recurrent neural network and prefetch the routes in the right order when they're needed. Regarding constraints, I would definitely encourage you to look at Rado's talk on power of constraints. He's going to talk there more about why we choose to use static HTML templates what benefits other constraints, such as uh, type systems, can give us, and much more. Well, talking about constraints, another constraint that we can set is performance budgets. So we can restrict uh, the, uh, we can, so we, we optimized our application, right? We use, introduced lazy loading, right after that we introduced prefetching, and our application is fast at a given point in time. However, we don't have the guarantees that our application is going to be fast in a week, week from now or in a month. And a big percentage of applications' performance regresses over time. So budgets are a great way for us to improve this metric by monitoring our performance in a CI. So with budgets, we can set a given threshold for how uh, big our bundles are allowed to be, and if our build process on some reason exceeds this threshold, we can just fail our build immediately and investigate where the failure came from. I'm happy to share that in Angular CLI 8.2, we introduced style budgets for components. We noticed that a very frequent pattern is for people to import font awesome, let's say, in a couple of their components, which was increasing their bundle size dramatically. So in order to help you prevent that, we introduce some default values in our style budget. So if your uh, styles exceed given size, your build is going to automatically file. Now, let us talk about enabling best practices. Regarding enable, enabling best practices, I want to start this part of the presentation by sharing a small personal story about my first contribution to Angular. So in 2013, I was uh, back then, well, we had AngularJS. Uh, I was using it for building a single-page application, and reading through the documentation, I noticed a very small typo in one of the interceptors examples. So I was really excited on contributing to a big open-source project. That was, that was something that I tried before, uh, before, before this moment, and wasn't really successful. So anyway, I kept, uh, I forked the Angular repo, I uh, fixed the missing uh, brace, after that, I wasn't sure whether there was actually a missing brace, so I removed the forked repo. I uh, reproduced the example in my, back then it was just Fido, I believe, or uh, my local editor. I finally ended up opening this pull request, and I started refreshing the page constantly in order to see whether someone is actually going to approve it. So I spent like this a couple of days, and finally Pete, who is organizing Kangaroo Connect, he approved my pull request, and it got merged into master. That was like a huge win for me. Like, I remember how excited I was that I did this pull request. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Yeah. And uh, of course, that's not my only contribution to Angular now. <laughs> From this moment on, I kept contributing more and more, developed a couple of tools for static analysis, but it was kind of hard to ship big features because the, the team is following some priorities and uh, we cannot ship a feature out of nowhere without making sure what is going to, whether it's going, not going to have any side effects, for instance. That is why we introduced the collaborators program. With some trusted collaborators, we tried to improve the engagement, like uh, help, us, help, help them help us to build new features and guide them through the process. One of the active collaborators who played a really important role in version 8 in the CLI is Manfred Stair. Together with him, we worked on differential loading. So we started with this design document. After a couple of conversations with the Google Chrome team, we discussed what could be the most optimal way to implement this feature. And finally, we ended up with the implementation that can pretty much improve your time to interact with sometimes over 30%, depending on your application. This is one of the defaults that we try to enable. So this is going to in version 8, we enabled it for all the applications out there. By using schematics, we transformed your project structure, we transformed your workspace files in order to take advantage of differential loading out of the box. Another research for enabling the defaults that we did was around serving. So we looked at HTTP archive, and we noticed that a lot of the Angular applications out there are not using content compression. Over 27% are not using broadly or gzip. And that's a very low-hanging fruit that can save a lot of bias to your users. We also noticed that even more applications are not using CDN. And a lot of these applications are used globally. So probably that's another thing that you may need to consider. You want to deliver the static assets to your users from the closest node to them. In order to enable all of this in serving of your application, we started working on ng-deploy. Engine Deploy is an initiative where we collaborated with uh, well-established cloud providers and community members in order to help you serve your application following best practices out of the box. Here is an example how this works with Firebase. So here, in our Angular CLI project, we're first going to add Angular Fire. Angular Fire, uh, ng add is going to trigger installation of Angular Fire, which is going to transform our project in some way. It is going to add some dependencies. And after that, it is going to connect to the Firebase APIs, where we can select a project that we want to deploy our application to. As a next step, we can just run ng-deploy. And this should handle the rest. It is going to figure out what is the most optimal way to build our application and the most optimal way to serve it by using the specified platform. Once the build process completes, it is going to upload our assets to Firebase, and we can go into, we're, we're going to get a direct link where we can preview the result. All right, so on this feature, we started early collaborating with Google Cloud and Firebase. We worked with Azure on ng-deploy. And uh, now I want to invite Muel on the stage to tell you more about our story collaborating on this feature and make you a quick demo. Hey. Hello, every, hi everybody. Uh, wow, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I want to show you uh, this little project that I'm working on, and I'll give you the presentation mode. Great. Oops. Yeah. Wrong window. Mm -mm. Where are we? Sorry for that. Terminal. OK. So we have here this very nice Angular. Where is it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
Here it is. We're working on this Angular application, and um, we're, uh, we want to host it. Um, it's, uh, uh, we're using static hosting. And like Minko said, uh, we're working on uh, different uh, platforms to deploy this Angular application for. And the Angular uh, team has been working on, uh, the, um, on, on allowing us some builders uh, uh, to add to the Angular CLI that uh, we can run the commands with and deploy it in two different platforms. And as I'm working on, um, on the Azure platform as a, an, a, a, as a cloud advocate for Azure, um, I decided that this is the way that I'll bring Azure closer to the Angular community. Um, so the project is called uh, Azure at um, NG Deploy. And you can find it on GitHub. Oops. GitHub. And it's published on M NPM. Okay. So you have everything that you need to know here. And of course, it's still under development. Um, and there might be some issues that you can help us with. But the, uh, the important thing is that you, that you can start working with it already. So how do you do this? Um, so I just want to show you the project. Project. Okay. Oops. No, this is what I wanted to see. Here it is. Okay. So this is a, an Angular project, and you can have routing and lazy loading, and you can have assets and everything inside, everything as usual. Um, then. When you run, here's the app component. When you run a ng add at Azure dash, uh, slash ng deploy, okay. um, right, existing, okay. Um, it will ask you several questions. You can override the existing configuration. Let's try this uh, out. It will ask you to, um, to log into Azure to select a subscription. And in its default mode, it will create the resources for you. It will create the resource group that we have in Azure for grouping resources. And it will create uh, a storage account um, where the application will be stored. And all the configuration will be found here at azure.json. All the name of your subscription, the resource group, the account, um, and also which project you're deploying and the target that you want to run before deploying. So the default is building the project uh, because we want to get the uh, build results with the configuration production. So you can also uh, change this if you have a different com configuration. Um, another thing that it does, it updates Angular JSON um, with uh, the architect. You see that there are different architects. Build is one of them, test is another one, lint, and it adds the deploy architect. So if you're using um, Azure Deploy, then this is, um, this is what you're going to see uh, with the configuration in Azure JSON and um, the host is Azure. If you're uh, using other uh, platforms, you will probably see here some different configuration. And um, now, from the newest version of Angular, uh, it's, I think, um, 8.3, we have the command ng deploy, so we can just directly uh, run this. And hopefully, it will run without many errors or bugs. <laughs> Um, so, like I said, first it builds it, and we've, uh, we've been thinking um, about how to do this, uh, how to uh, design this whole uh, tool of, yeah, and I have the error, of course, <laughs> um, how to uh, design um, 
the, um, what the tool does. And one of the things is whether, it, or where, whether we're going to build the project always before we run it or not. And uh, we've been talking uh, with uh, Minco and the Angular team and also other people who are working on, uh, on different versions of this tool. And, um, oops, and we decided um, that, yes, we're going to have to build the project every time so that you will have always the latest version of it. Um, and, of course, there are also other things that we might um, uh, we might use, um, and we're waiting for your feedback on this. Okay, so I'm giving here some old, older configuration that's going to work this time. And so it builds the project, it deploys it, and now it gives you the link, um, and it's just there on Azure. And you can all browse to this, to this link. Uh, the link is uh, composed of the name of the storage account, but of course you can uh, redirect it to your own um, a, a URL. Um, and um, that's it. It's, that's how easy it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you can find us on NPM, just Azure slash ng deploy. And please submit your, um, your issues, your comments, um, anything that you'd like. I have to uh, say that. This project is uh, being built and developed by advocates. Uh, so we're here to uh, hear your opinions and hear your um, issues and demands, and uh, we're going to talk to you about it. And we just want to make this tool really great for the community, because this is what we love to do as advocates. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody on the team, on my team of uh, cloud advocates who's been helping uh, me with this project. And um, the Angular team, of course, that uh, has been uh, doing their uh, work on their side on Angular and Angular CLI to allow us work uh, and, and on this wonderful thing that just helps as developers to do things better and faster. So thank you very much. Thank you, Smara. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the demo. Uh, as uh, Shmuela mentioned, we have been collaborating with a couple of partners from the beginning. Not only big cloud providers, but also community partners, or a lot of open source developers out there. So another of uh, our partners that we're talking often to is the company Zeit. You may have heard about it. They are developing the Next.js meta framework on top of React. So we have ng deploy to Zeit as well. We have been working with Angular Schule on the Angular CLI GitHub Pages deployment and Netlify deployment as well. Recently, actually just before I came to Angular Connect, I saw that someone implemented deployments to NPM. So if you're building a library and you type NPM and you type ng-deploy in the Angular console after adding this package, this is going to publish your library automatically. If you don't see your favorite platform here, however, Johannes developed an ng-deploy starter project. So you can just clone this, use the SDK of your cloud provider, and automatically uh, provide deployment capabilities through the Angular CLI. Now, let us briefly talk about the extensibility of the Angular CLI. In Angular CLI version 8, we introduced the stable new architect API, or Builders API. So the Builders API provides extensibility points to Angular CLI which allows to implement custom functionality, and it often involves development of ng-add schematics in order to add this custom builder in your workspace configuration file. 
So often when you're developing a builder, you just need to implement a function that does your custom feature and a schematic that introduces it to your project. After that, you can just run it with ng-run, the name of your application in the workspace, and the name of the builder. Let me show you what another community member, Benjamin Dobler, did with this new feature. So we just, add, uh, we just create a new application first. We call it desktop app. So this is kind of a spoiler with what he did. Once we uh, install all the dependencies, we can just ng-add the rich apps ng-tron. This is going to perform, again, some transformations on top of our project structure. It is going to install some dependencies. And when we ng-run the desktop apps uh, build Electron, we're going to get a desktop Electron application directly that we can develop by using Angular and Angular CLI. There, are, there, there was actually a lot of creativity from community. We noticed that uh, a lot of people started experimenting with Jest, with Cypress, even building Node.js applications by using the CLI. In fact, most, actually all of the builder plugins are implemented on top of this architect or uh, builder's API that we talked about. If, we, if you want to learn more on how to enable your custom functionality in the Angular CLI, you can take a look at our guide at angular.io.guide/clibuilders. Now, in the end, I want to spend some time talking about building at scale, and specifically Bazel, which could be used in the Angular CLI right now in an opt-in preview with the new Builders API. So most of you probably are already familiar with what Bazel was, but let, us, let me just spend a couple of uh, seconds, a couple of minutes, like talking about it. We have been using it internally at Google for over 10 years now. It has been building our entire monorepo. When someone submits a change list, a list of uh, files to this monorepo, Bazel is going to run the build process not only for the specific, specified changes, but also for all the affected other targets in the build graph. Bazel, in the same time, will be able to execute this build in the most efficient way possible by analyzing the build graph and distributing it among several cores or even cloud instances. In the same time, Bazel does not understand any particular technology. It is being augmented with different plugins. For example, if we want to build an Angular app, Bazel is going to delegate the execution of the compilation process to NGC or NGTSC, depending on whether we're using the current version of the Angular compiler or Ivy. A couple of open source projects that are using Bazel right now are Kubernetes, we have Selenium, also TensorFlow are using Bazel in order to build most of their C++ code base. We have projects from the Angular community as well, NGRX, and in fact, we have been building Angular with Bazel for over a year now. Joey is going to give you more details in his presentation right after this one. So we're pretty fortunate to be in the same company with Bezo as well, and we have uh, established a good partnership. Pretty much every Thursday at 9.30, I'm joining a call with the Bezo team where we're discussing how to enable building your applications at scale. Currently, we have been investigating what would be the best possible way to do that, and uh, there are two main things that we're looking at right now. How to make it efficient for Windows, and how to manage the build configuration of Bazel automatically. So let me share with you what is the current layering, since I mentioned that Bazel is independent from the, tech, from the technology that is actually building. We have Bazel, that is our build, build tool, at the bottom. Again, it doesn't understand anything particular about given technology, although it can build C++, JavaScript, C, Objective-C, Kotlin, and so on and so forth, it is not coupled to any particular technology because it delegates the actual compilation to a plugin layer on top of it. These are the so-called rules. We have rules for Angular, we have rules for Node.js, and for TypeScript. On top of that, so now you already, by using only these two layers, you can already build your Angular application by using Bazel. You can use Bazel CLI, and you can configure your build manually by 
describing the build graph in the so-called build files. In Angular, in, uh, on ng-conf 2019, Alex Eagle announced the opt-in preview of the Bezos integration with the Angular CLI. This is the layer at the top. So by using the architect or the CLI builders API, we're delegating the execution from the CLI directly to Bezo in order to handle your build automatically for you. So the news around Bezo are that uh, it is going to be released. It's version 1.0 1, this month. The Bezo team is working really hard on making this happen. And uh, it already got wide adoption, but we're hoping that it's going to get even greater adoption once it is announced as stable. Regarding the plugins for Node.js and Angular, we're still actively working on them. A lot of companies have already integrated them as part of, your, of their build process, but there might be some breaking changes eventually. And about the builder API and the integration with the CLI, that's how pretty much it looks like. We have the Angular CLI on top, which uses the builder's API that delegates the execution currently to Angular DevKit build Angular, or when you add Bazel to your project, to Angular slash Bazel. Both tools, after that, are going to delegate the execution to a particular build tool. For example, to a particular like, compiler or another tool that is going to perform an action to build your application. So this integration is still in Angular Labs. And if you want to learn more about it and about the Angular CLI's integration with Bazel, I'll definitely recommend you to look Alex Eagle talk from NGCon 2019 about the opt-in preview of Bazel. If you want to follow for, follow for updates around Bazel, I would recommend you to subscribe on bazel.angular.io or request support from one of our trusted partners. Often on events, I'm getting the question, should I learn Bazel? And uh, people are often concerned because it seems that it's very complicated to start using Kangur. You need to learn a lot of things, and Bazel is just another one. In fact, you don't need Bazel in order to use Angular at all. Bazel is just a build system that is going to produce, produ produce pro production executable assets out of your project. So you don't need to learn Bazel, but it might be a good idea for your career development, for your growth as a software engineer. It, has, it provides you with a lot of great good practices from functional programming implemented as part of your build process, where pretty much you have purity and uh, memoization everywhere in order to make sure that your build process is as fast as possible. So if you learn Bazel, it is going to teach you a bunch of good practices. And in the same time, you're going to create some reusable skills that you can reuse when you switch your job to a C++ developer, let's say. So as a recap, we are very fortunate to be able to participate in the process of moving the web forwards together with the different standardization committees. We're working really hard on automating your development experience with schematics, working on intelligent tooling, which can help us to take advantage of different powerful tools that can help you provide delightful user experiences, and enabling best practices by setting the defaults. Also, if you're interested in Bazel, please follow up on bazel.angular.io. Thank you. Well, that was a lot to take in, so that's a great start to the day. Um, we're having a break now. Um, we're going to be coming back at 10.45. Um, lots coming up on this track and behind you in track two. Also, our first mini workshop of the day and expert zone. Um, if you want to check out the schedule, it's on the website, and we'll see you back at 10.45. Thank you very much.
Hello and welcome back. So up next we have Joey talking about GitHub at scale. So let's hear it for Joey. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Joey Parrott. I'm Angular's developer infrastructure lead. That's developer infrastructure for the Angular team, not for everyone else, unfortunately. Uh, though a lot of the same things do apply. So um, today I wanted to look at a few pieces of our infrastructure and tooling and kind of what we do um, to manage such a large project on GitHub. Uh, before we actually look at what we do to manage things, I want to talk about a, a bit about what dev infra means to me. <laughs> Um, so first, uh, as we all know, Angular, part of Angular's goal is to uh, enable developers to make great applications. So Dev Infra enables Angular to enable developers to make uh, great applications. So we do this through um, trying to make the people who make Angular as efficient as possible with our tooling and processes. So as I mentioned, we're pretty busy on GitHub. Uh, every week, we receive more than 120 issues and 135 pull requests, and we need to be as efficient as possible uh, to get through all of these things. So much of this efficiency, I like to think at least, comes from that Dev Infra work. So uh, Dev Infra is typically a black box for people. Uh, if it's working properly, you don't think about it, you don't hear about it, and you shouldn't need to. But um, today, we're going to kind of look inside that black box, so to speak, at three things um, that I kind of want to cover. Uh, inactive closed issues um, and kind of uh, the way that we are now automatically locking those. Um, building Angular itself, building the framework um, as fast as we, as we can. And then also um, some of the, the uh, ways that we uh, consistently manage our repositories on GitHub itself. So first, we'll talk about keeping conversations current. So here's the problem. Over time, one of the biggest sources of noise in our repositories is actually from people that or from comments that happen on issues or PRs that have been closed and, in, and haven't been updated for a super long time. Somebody come in, comes in and comments something like, me too, which isn't really helpful to the conversation, plus it's closed. Or they comment and say, I'm having this issue still, but they can't, but now, We've actually fixed it, so the context is, is not there anymore. And it, it just creates a bunch of notifications for people that result in us asking them to just open a new issue with new context. So how can we actually minimize that noise? So we minimize that noise by encouraging people to have the conversations in the, in the relevant locations. So uh, we can prevent reviving these dead conversations and instead encourage people to just create a new issue by locking and leaving a message saying, hey, if you're still having this, just go ahead and do so. So I actually am going to walk through how we do this, um, specifically in our, in our repository. Um, so first, we have to decide when we would lock an issue. So for us, it became two, two pieces of criteria. We only want to lo lock issues that are already closed. Uh, we're not looking to just stop people from, from talking to us or to say that their issue isn't important. This is when we've already resolved something. And then past that, we want to make sure that the conversation is actually ended. So for us, we decided on a, over 30 days of time where nothing has happened on the issue. So now that we know what our criteria are, we actually have to be able to discover what those issues are so that we can automatically lock them. So uh, we looked around at what our options for doing this were, were and there's a few different um, different examples of uh, setups that have already been doing this. Nothing quite fit what we were looking for. And also, we have been looking for a, reason, or a way to test out GitHub Actions. So we actually chose to use GitHub Actions for this. So uh, we're actually gonna, I'm going to walk through how our GitHub Action works. So first, we have to find the inactive closed issues. So we do that using GitHub's API. You're likely familiar with at least the syntax of what the queries look like, as it's the same thing that happens in the regular UI. Uh, we're going to check the actual repository we want to look in, in this case, Angular Angular. We want to make sure we're only looking at closed issues. Uh, we actually want to look at only unlocked issues because, believe it or not, if you try to lock a locked issue, it does nothing. And we want to look for things that have been updated 30 days or more um, ago. 
So for instance, for today, that would mean looking at August 21st of this year. And then the last thing is we want to make sure that we sort so that, the, that the, we see the, lo, the oldest issues first, or the oldest updated issues first, so that if we have more issues than we're ready to lock at once, we start from the, the oldest and work our way back. So now that we have this query, we actually have to go and lock these discovered issues. So it's relatively simple as a, as a process. We, use, we create a GitHub client using GitHub's JavaScript API client, which is called OctaKit. And then we use that query we just, we just made and search for the issues that we are interested in. And then we loop through all of those issues, and we lock them. And it looks really easy. All you do is just call lock issues. But uh, what lock issue actually does is uh, we create a comment because we thought it was really important that we explain why we're locking the issues. So we have the same comment that shows up on all of our issues that are automatically locked and explains why we locked it where you can go for our policy, as well as making sure to note that a bot has done this action, and it's not, it's not anything against the people involved in the conversation. It's just that this criteria has been met. And then finally, we actually lock the issue. So the GitHub action is relatively simple. Um, we just run this uh, for our repository um, uh, on like a cron job, and it will actually lock all the issues. So we actually have to enable this for our repos, though. So uh, to do so, GitHub Actions are just uh, configured using a YAML file. So this is actually um, outside of the, the commit uh, message, or the commit number, I guess, uh, on the slide. This is actually what we use for the Angular Angular um, repo. So we set it up to run every day uh, at midnight. And we are able to just reference uh, the, the lock closed uh, action that we already created. So we actually are now seeing all these results. So over the last three weeks since uh, we turned this on, we've locked about 60,000 uh, closed inactive issues. Um, so for those of you who were subscribed to our GitHub repo and I caused a lot of spam to go to you, it's over. You can turn your notifications back on. And uh, now we just run it uh, once a day, and we're just seeing a few, day, a, few a day. Um, instead of this massive number. Um, and I really want to make sure that I note here, uh, Charles is actually the one who wrote the majority of this code. Um, and I just wanted to thank him for all of his work on it, um, since I definitely uh, am standing and talking about it, but he's the one who came up with most of how we do it. So next, I want to talk about how we build the Angular framework itself. So it's getting more complex. If we step backwards and look oh, sorry, at the problem, we're not going to step backwards yet. Uh, as Angular continues to grow, it's getting more complex and bigger. And that actually takes, makes it take longer to build and test all of the code. So we need to find a way to not take it, make it take as long, because that makes the, our developer experience worse. So if we look back now at AngularJS, building was simple. We had a bunch of files, and we combined them together, and we had our application. But now with Angular, we've added this, trans this transpiling that happens with TypeScript. So now we have to take the TypeScript files, turn them into the JavaScript files, and then combine them. And that step of transpiling is, or building is really where uh, the, time, the time is growing. So this is, this is a very simple application of four files as an example. Uh, but let's say we were to just update one of those files. Then once that one file is updated, we would have to transpile every the TypeScript file again and then combine them together. But it doesn't actually make sense because three of them, it's the exact same thing. So we actually want to do this incrementally and only transpile the files that have been changed and uh, just reuse the results from before. And so you've heard us talk a lot about how we use Bazel to do this. But this, is, this incrementality concept is actually something that Bazel provides, but is a general concept that um, we feel is extremely valuable for making builds um, as efficient as possible. So as I said, that was a really simple application. But most applications that I've seen, at least, have more than four files. You could have hundreds or thousands of files. And pretty quickly, we can become CPU bound, because you can only be checking or only compiling one file at a time with TypeScript. 
So let's say for my MacBook, for instance, it has two cores. So with hyperthreading, that's four. At maximum, I could be doing four at once. And it's a really fast process, but you still have to go through all of them. So we actually want to scale this out horizontally. Because all these cores could be used for something more useful, or at least more entertaining for myself. So instead of building these actions locally all on the machine, we can actually build them using remote build execution and send all of that work to the cloud, to some cloud executors to do this. So now, instead of being bound to just the four threads that I'm able to use, we could use however many cloud executors we have and expand that out. So now, instead of building locally, we're building these things in the cloud and getting back the results. But if things are building on the cloud instead of building on our own machine, we would lose that incrementality that we just talked about. So to get that back, we actually do remote caching. So with remote caching, the build is done remote and then saved. And then any time we, uh, we attempt to build again, we do that same caching or, or incrementality concept, but just doing it remotely. But one of the big advantages here is that once we build it remotely, it's available for anybody who is building remotely. So by all using the same remote uh, build executors and the same remote cache, uh, all of our developers, as well as our CI, can build the same objects and not, have to, and not have to rebuild them for each other. So once I build Angular core once, if nothing has changed, nobody else should have to build it again. We can just use it over and over. So over the last few months, we actually have set up remote build execution and remote caching for the Angular repository. We currently only take advantage of it in our CI, but we've actually found that, for instance, on our unit tests, uh, we've seen a 33% um, or we are 33% faster in running those. So you can see how at the beginning of this graph, we were adding more tests, more complexity, and it was growing. And then around this point, we enabled remote build execution and caching, and our graph went down. And you might be thinking, Joey, that's not centered. That's because there's more to the graph. I broke it. Then it fixed it. <laughs> and now it's, it's flattening out again, so we're good. So brings us to our next topic. We want to move fast and break nothing. So this is actually about how we manage code moving into our repository. So we need to bring in a lot of changes. As I mentioned, more than 135 pull requests each week. And we want to merge them as quickly as possible. But we need to not break anything for our users. So we need to maintain quality all the time. So to be able to achieve this, uh, we attempt to capture and mechanize as much as possible everything we can for deciding when a PR is actually ready to merge. So we require code reviews for all PRs. And we require that code, owner, that code review to come from someone who owns the code. And by doing this, we ensure that the code actually is maintaining the quality that we expect, as well as the, the conformance rules. And then we also maintain that the code that's being committed is actually going where we want it to go. We aren't going in a different direction, because the code owner is responsible for, for the direction of that portion of the code. We also do a lot of testing on CircleCI. So uh, we have code and commit conformance, conta conformance tests. So we make sure things like linting and um, that, the code, that the code that's changed has an owner. Um, and then we actually make sure that at any point in time, we can create an NPM package with what is currently in our repo. So we test actually packaging it, um, making that uh, NPM package. Um, we don't put it anywhere, but we make sure that it builds and is valid. We also run unit tests and integration tests across multiple operating systems and multiple browsers. And since our documentation site is stored alongside of our code, we test that the documentation site still works as we expect for every build that happens. So we've talked uh, on stages in the past about how Google actually builds using Angular at master. So to make sure that's possible, we actually have to check that we don't break anything in Google for everything that we want to bring into, bring into our repository. So luck, and luckily for us, Googlers are very good at using code, what I've decided to call creatively. And it leads to a very solid test suite. Because what seems to be any possible usage of the code is found somewhere in Google's, in Google's repository. 
So we have hundreds of thousands of tests that are checked for each PR before we merge them into GitHub. And we actually are doing the same thing now for testing IV. So we test uh, view engine code and make sure that it passes 100%. And for IV, we currently are at just under 98%. So we're testing to make sure that we aren't regressing back. So to maintain this, as I mentioned, we have to do this on all 135 PRs, which is a lot of work. And additionally, we have more than 30 people who could theoretically go to GitHub and press that merge button. So this would be absolute chaos if everybody just merged whenever they felt things were ready. So instead, we came up with a new role on our team, the caretaker. So the caretaker is responsible for making sure that, that our repo stays in order. So because of all of the, um, the checks that we just walked through, if everything there is passed, the, anybody, regardless of their understanding of the code itself that's being, that's being merged, can be confident that if, if all of those checks have passed, it's ready to be merged. And so it takes away the responsibility of deciding when it's appropriate to merge it, and it just makes it so that as soon as all of our, tests, all of our checks pass, we can go ahead and merge it. So this, the caretaker is responsible for actually doing that merging. They also monitor our CI, categorize incoming issues so that they can be triaged. They're also responsible for syncing those changes into Google and for uh, releasing new versions of Angular at the end of their rotation. Um, so it's a, quite a task. So we actually have an internal application uh, that we use to just manage this process for ourselves. Um, it allows us to create some uh, different sorting and different uh, filtering around what we care about to determine what's ready. And it also allows us to keep track of where things are going wrong and what's kind, what needs to happen for something to get into the right state. Um, so brings us to the last thing that I want to talk about, perfecting developer infrastructure. I know what you're thinking. Joey, it's a lot of success that you just talked about. You did it. You perfected it. No, it's not perfect. But we have very well shown that by dedicating time to making sure that our processes and tools get better, we are making things better for the people that are making Angular. So I just wanted to talk about a few things um, that I see as places that we can find impacts next. Um, we often talk about how the Angular Angular repository works, but the reality is that uh, we actually manage a lot of different repos within the Angular org. And so if we can unify the processes that happen across those repos, uh, we can be even more efficient and reduce the, the overhead that it takes to manage all of those things. Uh, so also with respect to the Caretaker app, uh, with the help of one of our interns this summer, Alyssa, we've been working on a new version of that Caretaker app that we hope to make available publicly that would give insight into the progress of each PR so that people can see what is being done on a PR or where a PR is at in the process and kind of demystify how things are happening through our repo. And lastly, I want to automate everything. Ideally, we would automate writing the code, but I don't think we're there yet. So things like cherry picking things automatically to patch branches, rebasing PRs, pushing new documentation, and automatically following up to ask for reproductions are all things that I think that we could start looking to automate to make ourselves uh, more efficient. So thank you. Um, the slides are available there, as well as if you want to look at the actual code for our um, automatic locking, it's available in our dev info repo. Thanks. OK, thanks very much, Joe. It was really interesting getting an insight there. So up next here, we have performance optimizations in Angular. And um, in track two, the heart of humanizing pull requests. Um, we are taking a bit of a longer break between tracks, about uh, 10 minutes. So um, I think next door is still going. So if we can try not to disturb them, that would be great. Thanks very much.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Grab a seat, and we're going to get started. So up next, we've got Mert, who's going to give us a talk about performance optimizations in Angular. Mert's also going to be in our performance expert zone after lunch if you want to carry on the conversation. So let's hear it for Mert. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. This is Mert. Um, I first let me let me start by explaining how how I got into uh, performance optimization. I work at Google, um, specifically Google Cloud, um, and for about four years uh, we've been developing Angular. We started with Angular JS, um, but now um, we have mostly Angular code. Um, so it ha we have a lot of developers, 300 or so develop front-end developers, and millions of lines of code. And somewhere along this migration, we noticed the Angular pages are not as fast as Angular JS pages, which was surprising because we're all we're using these shiny things. We're using our XJS, Angular, all that. Um, so how come it's slower? Um, so, we, I had spent a couple of months investigating performance problems. Um, before we go into these learnings I, I gathered throughout this process, I want to categorize some components because not all the solutions, that, uh, not all the anti-patterns that I discovered are applicable to all components. Like, um, so most critical components are list-like components, which are table, tree, select, if you have lots of data going into these components, these are, uh, it's important that these components uh, have good performance um, because um, that's where the data is and that's where the problem is gonna happen and the browser is gonna be uh, slow because of the, uh, the inefficiencies in these components. Um, the second most important components are the components that go into list-like components. Um, so if you have an icon that's in table or a button or a menu, it's important that these are um, efficient as possible. But if you have some components that are just used, has few instances on a page, it might be that you don't need any of these performance optimizations. So just keep in, that, uh, keep in mind when I'm suggesting some um, patterns or anti-patterns, um, these are mostly applicable to list-like components or the ones that are used uh, within those. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, first anti-pattern I'd like to talk about is usage of detect changes. Don't use this. Um, just use mark for check. Um, there are valid cases you want to use detect changes in, like if you're using detach or reattach. Um, but in our investigations of hundreds of components, it was mostly a code smell. Like we were, we were able to convert all of those to mark for check calls. And the reason you don't want to use this is because detect changes is synchronous. It, um, if you do this in a UI thread, it will block execution until Angular executes. Um, change detection on, on, on the subtree, and so it will freeze your page. Um, mark for check on the other hand is asynchronous. You can batch it, you can call it a thousand times, it won't do anything until the browser gets to the next tick. Also, mark for check doesn't violate the parent-child data flow, which um, Angular sort of assumes. Bonus point, use on push. Uh, I saw in one talk yesterday, this was mentioned already, on push is good for less change detection cycles. Um, another anti-pattern I'd like to talk about is usage of built-in Angular directives when it's not necessary. So for example, in this example, uh, in the code on the um, I guess left side, you see ng class with a binding um, that's hard-coded. This is not as fast as just using the um, class attribute by itself. Um, because 
Angular has to initialize a directive and maintain that object in a runtime. Um, again, so this sort of optimization is not that important if you do on a, a component that has few usages. But if you do this on a component at table cell and then you have a table with thousands of rows and cells, this is going to add up. Why is ng class bad in this case? Let me back up a little bit and explain how ng class works. ng class, like ng style, ng4, and a lot of other uh, built in Angular um, directives, uses this uh, helper class called iterable differs. What iterable differs does is that it tries really hard to compare two arrays and see what has changed. So if you have like a Array, like two arrays like that before it finds if, it's at, if something's been added, removed, or if it just changed index. Um, it uses complex data structures to achieve this. But like in the previous example, you don't always need this. Another example of this is ng style. And here we can just um, use a simple binding um, to achieve the same thing. And Angular won't achieve, uh, Angular won't need to use iterable differs. Again, if you have a table with like maybe 1,000 cells, that would mean 1,000 iterable differs. And those 1,000 iterables have maps, objects, all kinds of data structures to um, diff just this simple object, which it doesn't even need to. So just keeping that, uh, keep that in mind. Um, rather a controversial example is maybe you don't even need to use ng4, because you, so ng4 also uses iterable differs for good reason, um, because creating views are expensive, and when you create a new view, um, you kind of want to hold on to that, and if the array changes, you want to make sure you insert, insert that view in the right place. But you might know how your, view, how your array changes, items array changes better than ng4. Um, and it, it, it might be possible to achieve better performance using just what ng4 uses, just that, without the iterable differs. And you can also even add caching. If, so a lot of talks, um, a lot of, a lot of um, examples I share is kind of like re-implementing the wheel. If you do want to re-implement the wheel, I'd say go for it, just do it, because even if you fail, uh, you learn some lessons that can be applicable elsewhere. So, but if you do want to um, come up with your own ng4, I'd say also add benchmarks just to make sure your work actually improves things. Turns out it's quite hard to beat ng4 efficiency, by the way. Um, so another uh, anti-pattern that we discovered is if you have a structure like this where ng template is within ng4, Turns out Angular does uh, something interesting. So it, for each item in this array, um, it creates a new ng template instance. So if you have 1,000 uh, items, you have 1,000 ng template instances. But in almost, not almost, in all cases, you can move ng template to outside of ng4. And that would mean one directive um, instead of however many items you have. So just this is an, another anti-pattern that we discovered while investigating uh, performance degradations in ng2 migration. Um, sorry, I called it ng2. Sometimes people get mad. It's Angular uh, 8. <laughs> um, so, okay, so this is an interesting case because it's, so RxJS is really good in a lot of cases, but, um, it's really easy to write code that's like, oh, subscribe to all, all observables and um, just update the view, right? Um, turns out if you subscribe to only what's visible in the page, you'll get a lot of uh, good performance improvements. Um, this is intuitive, but while you're writing the code, it's like, it's easy to miss this. And so we have our own table component. Um, and when we did this change, we noticed 50% improvement in secret time. And so how we track these changes is actually interesting. I kind of want to show you that too. Uh, we have this internal cool, uh, cool tool called perfgate. What perfgate does is 
it tracks the output of the looper tools, like a script time, render time, and it records it. And we have um, CL, like a change list or a commit based uh, tracking on that. So if we, there's an improvement, we get a bug file. If there's a regression, we get a bug file. And when we made this change to only visible to uh, uh, only subscribe to uh, things that are on the page, um, we saw significant uh, increase in efficiency of rendering and uh, significant de decrease in um, memory usage. So I want to show you this, although it's an internal tool, I want to show you this because you might want to consider uh, having a tool like this where it tracks your script time uh, per CL basis and you see this, it became, um, it, it was taking five seconds and now it was taking 2.5 seconds. Those values don't matter as much as the percentages because we, are, we have like m maybe a million rows in this benchmark. Um, but even if you don't have resources to implement a tool like this, this tool is not, what it does is not rocket science. It just collects the data from output of the Chrome Developers Tool Performance tab. I think we, that was shown yesterday. Um, anyways, thought I, 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 I want to show this to you. So yeah, the output, the, when I say this improved performance by this much percentage, I'm talking about the value we got from the tool. Um, but I guess, so I guess the tool has the advantage of running it in an environment, in a controlled environment. So it's like if you have a developer's tool uh, running, that might be susceptible to other changes, other processes that are, yearning, uh, that are, your, that are running in your um, uh, computer. So you might want to invest some in, into infrastructure for um, tracking performance uh, degradations or improvements. Anyways, another uh, anti-pattern that we discovered is DOM elements per cell or DOM elements per component that is used within a list-like component. So in this example, uh, if you have a table component, it's really tempting to write, oh, I'll just write a component that has a DOM level, um, that has a DOM element um, that is going to display an individual cell. This is good, but it adds DOM nesting. And DOM nesting means Chrome has to do extra stuff. Um, when we tried this uh, to remove DOM nesting, we got 15% decrease in render time. Um, so another anti-pattern is using um, listeners per element. So if you have a tooltip, um, it's tempting to in Angular write, like, oh, I want to listen to mouse over event over there. Um, and you can add this per element. But if you have a lot of these tooltips on the page, like a tooltip uh, per cell in a table, um, that could decrease performance as well. Um, in fact, if, when we converted, uh, the, so why does it decrease performance? Because it misses the fact that events bubble up, right? You can have a one document level event listener that listens to mouse over event, and it will track uh, mouse over events for everything on the page. And you can differentiate based on event.target. Unfortunately, this is how, so like, um, current implementation of material tooltip, for example, uses a listener per element. Um, so when we switched from current implementation of, uh, current implementation of material tooltip to our own implementation, um, we saw 9% drop in script time. Um, Interesting note, the React does this on a framework level. So like, if the, you have only one event listener per, um, per event type, and everything else is propagated through synthetic events. So like, this might be a case where we learn from React, I don't know. Although I assume it would come with other problems when you have synthetic events. Um, so another anti-pattern that we discovered, this, should, uh, this is rather obvious, but we missed this for some reason. If you have layout trashing within a component that is used within list-like components, so again, a cell in a table, uh, that turns out it's really expensive because um, however items you have, how, uh, that many layout trashing happens. 
And when you see this, it usually looks like a large purple block on the uh, performance tab. And um, the way you fix this uh, kind of layout trashing is just um, try to read at a higher level, maybe, or don't read it at all. Um, or use a, a third party library like Fastom to read, uh, write, but then uh, bash those reads so you don't, have, you don't change anything in between. There's a full list of attributes that cause layout trashing. Um, thought this might be useful to share. So, for example, in our expanding row component, um, which is just a bunch of rows on our page, and then when you click on one of them, it expands but it collapses the previous ones. We, it turns out we had layout trashing, and uh, when we fixed that, it, it render time, turns out that 80% of the render time was, was just uh, Chrome re trying to recalculate the layout. Um, so that's how we got the improvement, by removing the layout trashing in a child component. Um, so another um, angular, I guess, the anti-pattern is using components um, within list-like components that have lots of bindings and DOM. Uh, so material checkbox, for example, is a good candidate for this. It has dozens of bindings. It has a quite nested DOM. On the other hand, material soda checkbox has no template, very minimal bindings. Although if you, when we convert, uh, so we converted this to material soda checkbox and we saw 8% drop in render time. But if you do this, you kind of lose some of the other things, the match checkbox so forth, like, like accessibility. So it's, uh, but even if you add those accessibility improvements, it turns out you still get pretty good improvement, um, actually 8%. Um, so this is the case with a lot of performance optimizations where you kind of sacrifice readability um, or compactness so that you, you get more efficient component. Um, in case you didn't know, some of the functions like set timeout, set interval, promise that resolve, these are all wrapped uh, in zone JS. And when these tasks are executed, Angular runs change detection. You might not want to run change detection. Um, so, for example, if you're just m mutating DOM manually in this case, in that, uh, um, if you, that's what you're doing, try using run outside of Angular to avoid Angular change detection. Um, batching these micro tasks uh, turned out to be a great idea. We had seen almost 60% improvement in script time uh, because we were doing set timeout within a child component of a list-like component. So if in a cell in a table, we were doing set timeout, which if, if you have a table with 1,000 cells, that means 1,000 set timeouts. That means thousands of change detection cycles. And we, we bash those by just, by just doing it on a higher level. So that's, that might be something else, something you might want to consider as well um, to improve performance of these components. Um, for nice sc scrolling without any scroll jank, um, use passive event listeners. Um, passive event listeners are not uh, natively supported in Angular. If you add like a mouse wheel like in the right, um, sorry, left example, um, it will add an active event listener, which means Chrome is going to wait until that uh, event list handler uh, is finished before scrolling. And the reason for this is that Chrome doesn't know that it's going to, um, the event listener cancel the event or not. But if you add passive equals true, scrolling is just going to be faster. Um, but you won't be able to cancel the scroll event, which in the majority of cases, you don't want to, or majority of cases I've seen, we don't, we don't cancel scroll event at all. So it's just a good improvement that you might consider doing um, using document that I don't event listener. Um, will change. This is rather funny because when we need to use this, it's usually the case that um, we ruled out every other reason, and Chrome is doing extensive like uh, uh, rendering stuff. Um, will change helps when it hints to browser that something is going to change about that element, and so browser is able to defer some expensive calculations. 
Um, use this sparingly, use this only when you need to, only when you see that large purple block of rendering in performance tab. Um, but it could, it's just one CSS change, it could dramatically improve performance of your app. Um, this is rather intuitive. Um, use visibility hidden instead of opacity zero, because when you do opacity zero, Chrome has to draw still, Chrome still has to draw every pixel, and then it reduces the opacity to zero, but when you do visibility hidden, what Chrome does is, um, it just tries to calculate the width and the height of the thing. Um, so just um, inefficient uh, to use opacity zero. Um, this was, so another inefficient uh, CSS. This was a surprise to us because, so we have like 50 or so front-end developers on our team, and none of us really knew why adding letter spacing would decrease performance. Um, we just find out, thanks to that tool I was showing you, this tool is just tracking all the changes and it was like, hey, there was an improvement when you removed letter spacing. And then we actively investigated that. I contacted the Chrome team and they were like, oh yeah, that's, that's just what happens. Um, <laughs> it's, it turns out Chrome, Chrome does some post-processing if you do use letter spacing with a non-zero value. So it first draws it and then tries to insert letter spacing. And we got 15% improvement just by removing this. Also, so the reason we were doing this in the first place is because using letter spacing was also causing issues in some of our integration tests. Some of our Firefox tests were flaky, I think. So we removed letter spacing. We got an alert from Perfgate saying something improved, and then we investigated, it turns out it's a, uh, something browser has to do um, extra. Um, that was it. Um, so let's talk more about it in the expert zone. Uh, the work that I presented is not just my work. It's, I learned from a couple of really smart people I, um, co my coworkers, um, yeah, Michael Liebman and uh, the other Michael, who I, <laughs> I just I just can't pronounce his last name. I, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried really hard, but oh, by the way, I signed up for Twitter for you uh, because I thought maybe I don't know. I I saw every other talk signing up for Twitter. Like showing their Twitter account, I was like, okay, I'll do the same. Um, anyways, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Matt. I think I think Matt signed up to Twitter so he could take part in the uh, Twitter competition, possibly. Um, up next, we've got in here creating a better culture in tech through diversity and inclusion. And next door, we'll have power and constraints. In about 10 minutes, we'll start up again. Thanks very much.
Hello and welcome back. So, up next, just before lunch, um, we thought we'd uh, have a bit of a change of pace. You've had a lot of technical talks. This is something that's really important and we feel really um, passionate about, about the culture that we build around tech. And to talk to you a bit more about that is Tracy and Rob. Let's hear it for them. So everyone ready for lunch? Lunch was actually pretty great yesterday. I was surprised that those little cardboard boxes were actually hot. <laughs> so I had the curry. I don't know what all you had, but. <laughs> well, hello everybody. Welcome to our talk. Thank you for coming to talk about inclusive architecture or how we um, help people build sustainable, inclusive development teams through the lens of helping junior developers using both Angular and something that we've liked to call the PAM stack. So what is the PAM stack? The PAM stack's just a fun name that we like to give to the three pillars that really help build these types of teams, and that's process, abstractions using tools like Angular, and mentorship. We're going to talk about each of these in this talk. So PAM stack is not jam stack. <laughs> which I think is what a lot of people refer to. Um, but when we look at inclusive architectures enabled with Angular, what we're talking about is a few different things. First off, it should actually enable less project maintenance. So a code base that's not just reliant on a handful of senior developers, less of stress because you have more process, which means you have more team buy-in, which is awesome. Also more cooperative teams because with code conventions and standards put into place, then all of a sudden you're not bike shedding all the time. Uh, you can also lower the cost over over time of developers, because you're not having to spend, again, top dollar on senior developers, because those are the only people that can actually be successful on your team. Also, more inclusion. With a good foundation, that also means that you can hire more diverse candidates. You can hire more junior, de uh, junior developers, which creates that greater diversity on your team. So we'll take a step back and just introduce ourselves. My name's Rob Osell. I'm a senior software engineer at This.Labs. I also host a couple of our podcasts, like the Modern Web Podcast, in the This.Labs podcast. My name's Tracy. I'm the lead at a JavaScript consultancy. I work with Rob. Uh, we do JavaScript consulting. So we typically just work with a lot of enterprises, helping them with their digital transformation, helping build uh, in-house low-code solutions, for example. Um, and we're framework agnostic, too. So whatever you want to use, we're happy to chat. I'm also on the RxJS core team. I'm a Google Developer Expert for Angular, Microsoft MVP. I also do a lot of community-related things. So if you ever want to get involved with community-related things or helping women in tech, I'm always happy to chat. She's a tough act to follow. That's why we do her <laughs> slide second. So let's talk about why juniors are actually not successful on teams. A lot of times we say, oh, you know, they're not skilled enough, et cetera. But it might not actually be for their lack of knowledge. Um, a lot of people perceive that, right? Like, oh, they're not, they don't have enough experience, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, did you ever think that this might actually be the fault of the teams and how it's set up? This means if you're not making inclusive decisions from the get-go in your code base, from structuring your team, um, this might actually be the reason why juniors are failing. But these decisions actually affect everybody, not just juniors. So here's some examples of things that our teams do that actually hurt juniors. So for example, we have poor onboarding documentation. You know, juniors would love to answer their own questions, but if there's no documentation, they're forced to just ask questions about everything that happens. This makes them feel like they don't belong, and it makes other people feel like they're just being bothered with questions. Or these teams rely on individual excellence. This means that seniors have to micromanage juniors because the team was structured in a way that nobody was allowed to make mistakes in the first place. Or your code base might be unnecessarily complex. This means that it's very difficult to make changes without causing regressions. And even if the junior was to ask a senior, it's probably the case that even some of your architects don't really remember why the code was built that way in the first place. Or your team might not have reviews, or it might not do mentorship at all. This is really important for junior developers because as they progress in their career, they need that input. They need that feedback. They need to be helped uh, steered in the right direction. And without that, they stagnate, and they never live up to the potential that they had. 
So these types of decisions don't just hurt junior developers and people coming into the industry. This also helps everybody. If you can't onboard people really well because you have poor onboarding documentation, that means that every single person you onboard is onboarded differently. They have different types of information. It depends on who's actually doing it. Um, everything's inconsistent. And you typically have to be a senior because you just have to jump in and just make it work. Um, in addition to that, uh, this whole idea of individual excellence, right? Relying on senior developers just to do the work. That means all of a sudden you have these things that we like to call hit by a bus fears. So if you uh, only have certain people that understand certain pieces of the code base, then what happens if they leave? What happens if they get hit by a bus? Uh, complex code bases as well make teams more unproductive. So it, when your code base deviates from industry standards, then again, it's much more difficult for anybody to get productive immediately. On the other hand, if you rely on things like standards and best practices, that means you can get productive from day one. Also, lack of advancement. We talk about mentorship in terms of junior developers, mid-level developers a lot, but the, the real thing is, the re reality is that everybody needs mentorship, right? How are you going to grow your senior developers into architects? How are you going to grow those architects into uh, partners? Those are, those are things that we don't typically think about. So let's get back to the PAM stack. Um, and again, these ideas are supposed to help you build an inclusive team. So we'll focus on process first. And a lot of you might hear the word process and say, oh my goodness, what is all this? What are we going to talk about next? But stick with us, because we think we can win you over. But to start out, what I want to do is I want to read a quote um, about a team that has no process. And as I'm reading this, I want you to think about whether it describes any teams you've been on in the past or maybe your team now, but you don't have to raise your hand afterwards. All right, so on these teams, processes are usually ad hoc and chaotic. The organization usually does not provide a stable environment to support processes. Success in these organizations depends on the competence and heroics of the people in the organization and not on the use of proven processes. These organizations are characterized by a tendency to overcommit, abandon their processes in a time of crisis, and be unable to repeat their successes. So if you, like me, felt a bit personally attacked when I was reading that, um, just know that we have some tips that can help you out and, and make sure that this isn't true for your teams in the future. So a lack of process basically means that, again, only rock star developers can succeed. You're constantly overcommitted. You're rushing things. You have no idea why a project failed or succeeded. This is me. Probably like a lot of startups, if you've ever been involved in a startup, projects always go over schedule, over budget, and then also nobody knows who's supposed to do what, right? Roles and responsibilities aren't well defined, and you have a lot of bike shedding, and this, cause for a lot, this causes for a lot of stress within teams. So if process is actually done correctly and, and conscientiously, then you can get a lot of benefits. So one of those benefits, of course, is clear expectations. As a team member, you know what's expected of you in order to be successful, but you also know what you can expect of the people around you and what they're supposed to accomplish. You have greater team engagement and cooperation, because again, when you know what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to be doing it, then you can hold other people accountable and they can hold you accountable as well. You'll also have no single points of failure. Again, the process takes all that information and makes it public so that it's, if one person takes a day off or a week off, um, it's not everything falling apart as people forget what it was that that person did. There's also going to be less stress during the crazy times. Just before a major release is not the time you want to deal with a really crazy edge case um, in your process or, or trying to decide what to do in a really complicated situation. When you have your process and you have these things decided ahead of time, then you can go into these stressful times with comfort knowing that you've already planned for that. And of course, you'll have reduced conflicts and fewer power struggles. Because the process, again, lays out what, how things are decided and what you're going to do, decisions don't feel arbitrary and they don't feel like they're being hoisted upon you. So there's a ton of different types of process methodologies if you Google, and no single one is actually best, but they typically follow a very specific format. So the first thing is going to be defining the expectations. When things are calm and you're not stressed out, then write things down and figure out, hey, what are we supposed to actually do? What is the actual plan? Then you want to go ahead and figure out how you're going to actually meet those expectations. So how are you going to enact the plan, step-by-step -step lists, uh, checklists, training? Uh, then you need to verify that 
expectations were actually met. After you do everything, uh, make sure you're reviewing not just the code, uh, but plans, requirements, designs, et cetera, et cetera. And then also making sure you're actually recording the results. So what are the different metrics that you should be actually looking at? And then after you're done with that, then go ahead and go back and review those accomplishments and say, hey, what do we set out to do? Was everything we did right? And then continue to go through that process and improve your team. So a good first step to being successful with process is to actually create these plans. You sit down as a team and you say, hey, what are the things we actually do here? You know, who needs to do those things? How should they be doing them? And when should we be doing them? You actually write these things down, and then you follow them. So here's an example of a plan, or at least a bit of a plan, for a code review process. So it lays out the purpose of this process, why we do it in the first place, and then it walks through a set of steps. An example step is shown there on the screen. But most importantly, and what I want to draw your attention to, is that it deals with all the extra situations. So for example, what happens in a code review if an author and a code reviewer disagree on a change that should be made? Well, some teams might do it where the author gets to decide. Some might do it where the reviewer gets to decide. Or worse still, teams might rely on the individual power dynamics between those two individuals to just have one of them power over the other one. Well, this process says, well, the two people should try to uh, work it out themselves. But if they have a disagreement, they just tell the director, the development manager, and they make the decision. Suddenly, again, this conflict is depersonalized. It doesn't feel arbitrary. We know exactly why decisions are being made. But even extra situations like, hey, can our code reviews end if there are still some issues that are unresolved? Again, this is not something that you want to be deciding arbitrarily in the middle of your project. You want to know up front. And here it says, yes, that's absolutely fine. Just put the information in your bug tracking system at the end of it, and then you can close the review and move on. So another thing that I feel like is very commonly overlooked is actually sitting down and defining your roles and responsibilities. So here we have a simple list of people, everybody who's participating in the code review in, in this particular process, and you list down again the responsibilities of each role with respect to the actual process. And this way, everybody knows, hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and there's no question later on or no hurt feelings, et cetera, et cetera. Another really easy thing to do when you think about process is just create checklists. So you think about it, right? Uh, when you're doing things like a code review or anything like that, you're thinking about different things that you have to do. There's certain steps. So wouldn't it be nice if you just had a checklist that you could refer to? What this is going to do is it's going to reduce the error-prone way of humans. We're all human. We make mistakes. It also is really useful in just giving it to a junior or somebody who's joining your team. They're wondering what they need to do. All they need to do is reference the checklist. Also, during the busy times, wouldn't it be nice if you just had a piece of paper telling you, oh, yeah, that's what I was supposed to do. No, I didn't actually miss anything. So we've talked a lot about reviews, and it's just because reviews have so many positive effects, the most obvious of which, of course, is improved quality, right? It's great to catch mistakes before they go much further on and they become more expensive to fix. But you also get this cross-pollination of ideas, right? You have somebody who produced a piece of work, uh, who's sharing what they did in their approaches with a reviewer, and the reviewer shares their feedback or their thoughts with the author. And this sort of cross-pollination of ideas, again, is really good for reviews. Um, you also get redundant learning, right? You have people looking into things and reviewing things that they might not otherwise be familiar with. You're reinforcing that knowledge across your team, and again, making sure that if somebody was missing, that somebody else could step in. And of course, reduce stress and eliminating the fear of making mistakes. It's very stressful to be on a team when you have to do your best work every day or else your users suffer. It's very nice and relaxing to know that somebody's always going to be checking your work to be catching some of your most obvious mistakes. Now, it sounds a bit paradoxical because when you feel that relaxed, you'd think, well, you'd make more mistakes thinking that someone's going to catch them. But the opposite is true. You actually make fewer mistakes because you're more relaxed and you're not constantly on edge worried about making mistakes. So another thing you also need to make sure, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, was again, review all the things very often. So we are obviously familiar with code reviews, but also be reviewing your meeting notes. Check, like, did you miss anything? Do you have any disagreements about what you're supposed to be doing? Designs, do you agree, disagree? Requirements, are they actually the right requirements? Are you testing the right things? Who knows, right? Um, and if you're doing consulting like us, emails to clients. Are you on the same page? Is the messaging the same? Did you promise something that you shouldn't have? Making sure the entire team is on the same page is very important. 
Um, and then after a while, you should be stopping and saying like, okay, now what do we do, right? And you're revising and reiterating. Can we improve on our execution? Can we improve our processes? Is the data we captured actually useful? Should it actually change? So that's enough process. And now let's talk about abstraction, specifically with Angular. And um, we'll kind of go through this. But the, the whole idea in uh, this specific pillar is giving you ideas of tools and approaches that are going to help your team actually achieve greater happiness, productivity, and inclusivity. So let's start by just acknowledging that web development is hard. A lot goes into making accessible and performant experiences for our users, right? So we ask web developers to be experts in performance, security, accessibility, responsive design, progressive enhancement, browser compat compatibility, progressive web apps, and honestly, this list could go on and on. Every year, it feels like there's more stuff to learn. And this kind of fuels some of these phrases you've heard, like JavaScript fatigue or imposter syndrome that's across our industry. But the amazing thing about what we have are frameworks, right? And so, you know, see, a lot of senior developers might say, hey, it's easier and faster for me to do raw DOM manipulation, but you're leaving a lot of different people behind. So I remember when I was first learning how to code, and I was trying to build these websites, and I was messing around with a marquee tag, and HTML, and CSS, and JavaScript. And finally, my teacher looked at me, and he said, OK, fine. I'll give you a framework. And so he did, and all of a sudden, I was building amazing websites that weekend. I spent the entire weekend building amazing websites. So um, the great thing about a framework like Angular is that it lets you deal with things like basic performance and scalability. So imagine if you join a really large company. A really large company has a ton of different developers, hundreds of different teams, potentially. And where do you actually get started, right? Like, how do you actually start? It could take you months to figure out what on earth is going on, how things are structured. But if you have something like Angular in place, then all of a sudden, you can pretty much get produ productive immediately, right? If they're following the basic code conventions and standards, you know what you're doing, and you can just get started from day one. I also really love things like Angular CLI that we have. There's tons of CLIs. I feel like it's the rise of the CLI these days. But you know, this is kind of a small list of things that Angular CLI gives you. I mean, I think the most notable, are, again, are the out-of-the-box performance, uh, automatic differential serving, lazy loading, tree shaking, ahead-of-time compilation. Um, the, it's wonderful that we can migrate uh, from bet and between major versions of the library, um, and the fact that it's also actively maintained. And again, if you don't like it, or for some reason later on, it's very low risk for you because you can just eject if you need to. Another really powerful tool for building websites that work well for junior engineers is using things like state management. Of course, in Angular, we have really great tools for this, like NGRX. And these systems allow us to isolate our business logic away from our presentation logic, right? Instead of commingling it all together. This lets us do the really complicated stuff in one place and the, and the slightly less complicated, or at least the different concerns in another place, right? You can worry about building semantic HTML and accessible experiences on the one side without worrying about how that does real-time communication or any of the other various features that your application relies on. One great analogy that I like to use for this are the Amazon Dash buttons. I don't know if anybody remembers these or ever had one of these. Um, but these are buttons that you simply would press them, and then whatever the product was that was on the button would get shipped to your house. It's just sort of like, I needed more of this, and so you'd press it at the moment that you realized it. And what, what I like about this is that it tells you, or what it doesn't tell you, is how it actually connects to your Wi-Fi and makes an order and decides where to send it and how to debit your account, right? All of that is obscured. You just worry about pressing the button, and the product arrives. So your senior engineers or um, you know, any of your other engineers can, can model a lot of your business logic in this similar way, hand a lot of these dash buttons to your uh, UI engineers, and they can just wire these up to the UI, and you have a reasonable expectation of success. Another great thing about Angular is the fact that we have TypeScript as well. And I love this because you know, with JavaScript, you can get carried away with confusing little bits of code. But TypeScript, you're basically forced to have strongly typed methods, variables, and services. And this allows you to better and much easier understand the functionality and purpose of each part of the code. And because it's stricter, that means it also comes with less bugs, which is way more awesome. And I also really love it because there's better error handling, so you can easily spot the root of the problem problem easier. And also in your console, you have more descriptive errors, right? Um, so you can better figure out what to, 
what is wrong. And the great thing about this is also when juniors are learning on TypeScript, um, it makes them more conscious and more careful in terms of designing new things and helps teach them best practices. So one common mistake we see with a lot of teams is not being more deliberate with their user experience, right? So a lot of teams will start out every brand new project, and the first two months is always building the same types of date pickers or autocomplete boxes or modal windows that they've built on every project they've ever worked on, right? Or teams deal with something that I like to call the Bob Ross effect. This happens when designers will give teams designs, and then the developers will take those and paint them fresh on every uh, page with new CSS and new HTML as if there was no other existing CSS that they could take advantage of. This builds up your CSS over time, then people have to start using the important attribute, and then everything falls apart. This is why we advocate so heavily for companies to be using design systems and component libraries. And luckily for us, we have Angular Material, one of my favorites. And I love the fact that we just have ready-made UI components, and you get really complex things like animations, out of the box, um, you know, the menus, the headers, the chips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other great part about Angular Material is the team has thought a lot about the more complex things and abstracting those things away. For example, the state of a dialogue component is, you know, basically it's, you're provided a default already, right? Um, there's also a lot of really amazing code samples in the documentation, which I think is extremely helpful, and also the easy global theming. So I'm going to let you guys in on a little bit of a secret. I've been really obsessed with state machines lately, and I think that state machines are about to explode. They're a really powerful way for people to isolate business logic again um, and to code it independent of the solutions or the syntax of the frameworks that we choose to use. So when I say that it's exploded, I think 2020 is going to be a big year for state machines, um, because recently people have been talking about how to use them to automate testing or build really interesting games or how to minimize the amount of code that you need to use to uh, make really interesting changes to your UI. I think they're starting to be really popular, and um, you should be looking into them if you aren't already. Here's an example of a state machine, a pretty complex state machine that uses the library xState. Now, a lot of this isn't going to be readable, and that's fine. I just wanted to show the scale of how these things can grow. This covers um, the entire sign-up flow for Ryan Florence's workshop system, and it covers so many edge cases, like people that don't have accounts, or uh, workshops that sell out, or people that have coupon codes. He's accounted for a lot of different logic in this state machine, and he can have people uh, analyze it independently, right? When he's done, he gets sort of this data output that he just binds to his UI, but it doesn't matter the solution he chooses. It can be React or Angular or Vue. That's what's powerful about this, is that he's captured the logic in a place that it doesn't matter what solution he'll ultimately use it in. Um, and again, if he binds it up faithfully to his UI, then he knows that things are probably correct. So other really amazing things that can help enable your team are things like Prettier, for example. Um, you know, with Prettier, if you're using Prettier and somebody gets onboarded on the team, then you're not having to constantly think double quotes or single quotes, spaces or tabs, there is a convention, and that's it. No more conversation. So that's really powerful. I think NX as well is really amazing. So these are dev tools for monorepo development, and this allows you to share code and libraries between front end and back end really easily, and it reduces the amount of code and complexity. Also documentation, right? We always talk about documentation and how important it is, but I want to say it here too. Again, the Angular documentation is so extensive and so complete, even to the point where there is actually an Angular Docs team, and this allows you to um, learn core concepts much more quickly. Also, the Angular community, whether you're online on Twitter, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. Everybody's there. Um, well, most of us are there. Um, <laughs> or physical presence, right? Like, we have amazing Angular meetups everywhere. Um, and these things and this community helps you evolve over time, right? And the Angular ecosystem and the Angular team has thankfully actually spent a lot of time thinking about, hey, how do we be more inclusive? They are actually making it part of their mission, which really helps helps um, a lot for who we are as a community. So we've talked about two pillars so far, process and abstractions using Angular. So let's talk about mentorship. And one of the reasons that this pillar is so important is because it really represents a culture shift for a lot of our organizations. And we like to represent that in sort of a thought experiment, right? What would it be like in your company if there was a rule that said nobody in the company could be promoted unless they could nominate someone to take over their role? How might that change the way that people in your company interact with one another or approach their day-to-day -day lives? 
Suddenly, it's not so beneficial to just sort of selfishly pursue your own promotions uh, and ambitions. You have to be keeping an eye out for who are the other top performers in your company, mentoring people up, and helping to retain that talent. Suddenly, the cult of the rock star developer fades away, and we start to value rock star mentors instead. I really love this, and obviously there's so much benefit for mentees who are involved in this process. Number one, it accelerates their learning and growth, it increases their confidence, it also decreases the fear of contribution, they're not scared anymore because they're getting validation that, hey, it's okay. It increases communication skills. The more you can talk about your code in a good way, the better developer you become. Um, you also feel, as a mentee, more invested and valued. And also, um, there was a study that actually found that mentees are five times more likely to be promoted. In addition to that, the mentees and how they have been mentored translates on because then those mentees become mentors and then all of a sudden you're building this better culture within your organization. But mentorship isn't just a gift that we give to the people being mentored. It also has a lot of values for the mentors themselves and the companies that do this. So it's a great perk for recruiting and obviously for retention as well. Um, it also reduces knowledge silos and helps you really solidify your corporate culture. But more importantly and interestingly, it's not just the mentees that are getting promoted. Mentors are significantly more likely to be promoted as well over people that aren't mentoring. This is something that's good for everybody that's involved. Everyone in every company should be involved in mentorship. So you might be saying like, okay, of course we know that mentorship is important, fine, but then how do you actually practically add it to your team? So there's a few different things, right? But in, uh, pretty much you're basically trying to foster this culture of teaching and sharing. So you can do the formal one-on-one -on -one sessions where a junior and a senior might go into a room and talk about development. You can also do code reviews. So with code reviews, authors learn from comments on their reviewers, and reviewers are learning new patterns that are actually really important potentially to the system. Also, pair programming is really amazing, right? And this is where the senior will say, hey, write this, and then the junior will actually be doing the coding. Tech talks as well, during lunch or any time. If you start just giving five-minute tech talks to your team, um, this helps it, uh, inspire other people to do these types of things. Also, chat channels. If you just set up a place on Slack, for example, um, where developers can share links and discuss problems and solutions, these types of small little steps are helping foster a better culture for your teams. So we've talked about a lot of things today, but they can all be summarized into the PAM stack. Makes it easy to remember. Process, abstractions using tools like Angular, and mentorship. But if you know, you're sitting here, and maybe you're a junior developer, um, and you feel like, well, I, don't, I can't make my team do these things. What can I really do? Because some of this stuff sounded really interesting to me. Well, there are some things you can do. For example, you can bootstrap process on your team by just writing down things that people are doing, and then share that with the team. Or you can volunteer to mentor and help your peers who are being onboarded, right? Just be there to answer their questions. You can ask other people questions about the project or the code or the processes that you're following, then actually write down the answers that they give you, and then put those answers somewhere where other people can find them for the next time they have that question. You can do and ask for code reviews proactively. So you can say to someone, hey, I've been working on something. Can you come look at it while I explain it to you and just get your feedback on it? Or, hey, can you explain to me what it is you've been working on? I'm actually really interested to know what other people are working on. This uh, will start to create that culture of code reviews and get people excited about it. And if your team loves your process, and you'll know this because they'll say, you know, I've really been noticing you've been doing a lot of code reviews with people lately. That's actually really been useful. Thanks for doing that. Then ask to make that process more solidified. Write it down and enforce it, and it starts to become the thing that your teams are doing every day. So hopefully you all enjoyed that, but also yeah, at this.media, we love to give back to the community and we really believe in building this inclusive web. So we host a lot of online events and uh, these are really amazing for, you know, if you're, if you're here at Angular Connect, but maybe you traveled far to get here, uh, if you want to be a first time speaker, this type of stuff is less scary, right? And also anybody can join. These are fully recorded as well. Every first Thursday we have Angular online and then we have React and Vue as well, and then Katarina on our team who's in Athens, she's actually giving a cloud functions and Firebase training on October 8th. We're also providing diversity scholarships. So again, if you're excited about this, just let us know. Um, and then of course, if you're interested in any Angular consulting or anything like that, we're obviously always happy to chat and we're always hiring. So even if you don't feel qualified, it never hurts to just send an email and, uh, you know, Come see me and Rob after. I have stickers up here as well. Uh, Women in Tech stickers, GraphQL, RxJS, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you.
so I think uh, in addition to that, I just wanted to let you know, I will also be hosting the diversity and inclusion lunch, which is happening right now. There's going to be lunch in the room. It's going to be on the second floor. So come check it out. Uh, we'll be having, I think, Robert and Stephen Flew, Robert from Angular Girls and Stephen Flew from the core team giving little talks as well, sponsored by Narwhal. Thanks, Narwhal. And uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, like Tracy said, if you want to head down for the diversity lunch and for everyone else, um, there'll be a lunch break now on this floor and downstairs as well. There'll be food. And see you this afternoon. Thanks very much.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. How was it, right? Yeah, OK. Uh, wow, I'm really enjoying Angular Connect. Uh, it's, uh, so far, it's been so great, so awesome. And uh, how are you enjoying it? <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Yeah. OK. We have a few more sessions to go, and I think they're super interesting. I'm really looking forward for them. And uh, don't uh, forget the panel in the end of the day. And, uh, but first thing first, we're going to uh, start with another Slido qu um, at quiz, but <laughs> question. Um, so log in to slido.com, enter the code Angular Connect, and this is a very, very, very uh, important question. Which Angular version are you using? Okay. So let's take a a few seconds to answer that, and let's see. Where's 10? Where's 10? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so there. So, so we're including Angular JS there also, okay? So Angular 1 point something, okay, that's okay. Uh, but wow. 6%, 5% with AngularJS, which is great. And we've had a lot of good things, a lot of uh, very um, good ideas that we're taking from there to the new Angular. So that's why I love Angular so much. And I really, I'm really happy to see that most of you, the vast majority here has updated their projects to Angular 8, which is the latest uh, current version. And some are even experimenting with the next one, version 9. That's really awesome. Thank you. Um, so now, while you're still on slido.com, you can now submit your questions to the panel tonight. So uh, please do that. The panel is interactive. It, uh, they will answer your very important questions, and I've seen um, last year, for example, there were some very interesting things that uh, were um, were asked. Um, all right. So before we start the sessions, there is a very important uh, uh, presenter from one of uh, uh, the sponsors, Infragistics, and I'd like to invite Kirill Matev from Infragistics to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you for making time for this session. It's great to be in front of you. It's great to have met so many of you over the last couple of days. We handed out so many socks. We're almost run out of socks. It'd be great to see the rest of you at our booth to have a chat. So um, I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to talk to you about Ignite UI. Um, and um, what we can do for you. We're really proud to be sponsoring this event. We're really proud to, uh, to be here um, and stand uh, side by side with Google and meet so many of you. So I'll go through uh, just a quick introduction of who we are and what we do. Uh, as a company, we've been around for about 30 years now, so we've been building UI controls all these years. So we know a lot about building reliable, stable, high-performance controls, grids, charts, you name it. So over the years, we have a lot of expertise in making things easy to use for developers. And we know developers. We've, we've worked with you maybe for the last five, 10 years, with some of you at least. So we partner with uh, all the major players in the industry. So um, we're a Microsoft partner. We're a Google partner, of course. And we work with all kinds of uh, companies. We work with one or two developer teams all the way up to you know, your big, your big cor uh, corporate development organizations with 200, 500 developers. And we work across all industries. So whether you're building a transportation kind of application or just a simple website to manage customers for, uh, for a consultancy, we can do a lot for you. So we have more than 1 million developers who've used this over time. So that's a massive community that's used our tools. And we're spread across uh, the entire world. We can support you. Um, anywhere you are. So we have offices all around the world as a company that's been around for 30 years now. Um, the product that we're uh, showing here is Ignite UI for Angular. It's a modern set of UI controls that's materials-based. 
Uh, we don't just do a grid. Uh, we also have uh, almost 50 controls on top of that. We have uh, charts. We have input controls. We have layout controls. We have navigation controls. So our goal is to enable you to take one toolkit and meet all of your needs across an entire application range. So whether you're building a line of business application with lots of data entry and grids, or whether you're building dashboards, you can use our toolkit across the whole solution. And what's great is that it's material-based. So we support the material design themes out of the box. So you don't need to worry about different controls from different vendors. Oh, how's this one styled? How does that one work? You take one vendor and all the controls from us with a CLI to allow you to very quickly get up to speed on how to use them. So something we do is um, we also have plugins for Visual Studio Code. So we do a lot of code generation for you. So with the CLI, you're able to scaffold the project. You're able to configure the grid. You don't need to learn our API. You don't need to kind of memorize any API members. You can use the CLI to scaffold our grid and to enable specific functionality like uh, grouping or filtering or anything like that. So uh, without any further ado, this is our grid. I'm sure you've seen lots of grids. So what's the difference uh, between our grid and all the, many of the grids out there? The big difference is we're material-based. So everything is customizable in the exact way that you know, Google wants it to be customized. So that is our advantage. We play by the rules. We play by the standards. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel or, or come up with a new way of doing things. We're basically playing by the rules and making it easy for you to reconfigure any aspect of this grid. Um, our biggest advantage as a whole compared to the competition in general is performance. So I know everyone talks about performance, but we've done a lot of work around that because of our customer base, who are uh, some of the most, um, some of the companies that use the most data in the world, like financial services. So we've done a lot of work around virtualization, and on top of that, we've added grouping, sorting, filtering, all the usual functionality you expect in a grid. Um, we have a very powerful Excel library, and uh, you can see us uh, at the booth outside. It'd be great to meet you, talk to you about your needs. Um, you can find us online. Uh, we're available on GitHub. The product is free to download. You can try it out. If you want to use it and get rich off it, uh, you'd need a license. And that's where uh, we come in to support you and to learn more about your needs. Of course, we're on GitHub, so you can submit any issues, any questions. Um, any, any concerns you have. So that makes it very easy uh, to communicate with us. Just to show you very quickly what you can build with our tool, uh, with our tool set. Um, I don't know if that's, OK, there we go. Um, OK, there we go. So that's just one dashboard that's built with our data visualization tools. So we're not just a grid company. We allow you to build a lot more with our charts, with our maps and gauges, and so on. Uh, on top of that, we also have a great chart that you can see has a lot of interactivity features. We fully support all the zooming and um, you know, overlay functionality, so you can do a lot and deliver a lot of value to your users. You can really unlock the power of the data that you have, because there is a lot of charts out there, but none of them are this, uh, this fast or this functional. So definitely take a, uh, take a look at our product. It's on GitHub. As I say, it's, it's material-based. It's easy to style, easy to use, easy to customize. And we, as Infragistics, we as a team just out there at the booth, we're here for you. So come talk to us. It will be great to, to meet you. So with that, my five minutes are over. <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, for your time, and uh, hope to see you at the booth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill and Infogistics, for your support. So I'd like to tell you how uh, I first um, um, saw the name of our next speaker online. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, researching the Angular forms when Angular 2 was still in beta, I think. And I was uh, preparing a, a talk and, and uh, um, an application using the Angular forms. And it was a bit difficult at the time. Uh, things weren't very in order and um, a bit confusing. So I was looking over all the information that, I, that there was. and. Uh, then I stumbled upon a design document that really uh, set everything in place, that said, okay, this is the way that it's done now, and it's confusing, and this is how we should improve it, this, and 
all the reasons why, and it made a lot of sense. And luckily enough, also the all of this or most of this was implemented right before I had to uh, show uh, the application, and I had just enough time to work on this. And the person responsible for this design document is Kara, and. <laughs> Um, really, you made a lot of sense since that, and since then I've been following you. Uh, sorry, it sounds a bit creepy. Uh, <laughs> You've been following me <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I'm a real groupie, um, and uh, Kara has been working um, lately a lot on Ivy, the next uh, renderer of Angular, and she is the tech lead of the Angular team. So <laughs> if anyone knows how Angular works, I, I bet that's Kara, right? <laughs> Kara Erickson. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to How Angular Works. Um, I guess I don't need as much of an introduction since I just got such a, such a great one. Um, but I'm Kara Erickson. I'm the tech lead for Angular's framework team. And um, as she said, I, you know, I work day to day on the Ivy runtime. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how Angular works. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, so when you're building an application with the framework, it can sometimes be kind of hard to imagine what the framework is doing under the hood. But by the end of this talk, I want you to be able to visualize kind of how your application code and the Angular framework code are working together. Um, so just to jump right in, Angular broadly has two parts. There is the Angular compiler, which is our build time utility, and the Angular runtime. And that's the framework code that ships with your application and actually runs in the browser. Today, we're going to focus on the runtime portion. Uh, but if you're interested in how the compiler works, I'd highly recommend checking out Alex's talk from yesterday. Uh, it should be on YouTube soon, and the slides are also linked in my presentation. Uh, but for our purposes today, all you need to know about the Angular compiler is that it, in addition to downloading your TypeScript to JavaScript, it also parses your Angular decorators and your templates, and it generates some code that the runtime can understand. So if we take a look at this component example, um, we have an add component decorator like you'd write in your application. What the compiler would do is it would take this information and it turns it into something that we call a component definition or a component def. And this contains all the same information, but just transformed into something that the runtime can actually use. Um, so uh, one way to think about it would be that the compiler generates you know, these definitions and these instructions. and the runtime actually implements those instructions to actually run as your application is running. Um, so this definition probably looks kind of intense right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. But don't worry about understanding what's in it right this second. Um, throughout the course of the talk, I'll be explaining what these instructions are and how they work. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you can read these with confidence and happiness. Um, OK, so when an application bootstraps, there's three main phases that it goes through. There's module setup, and this is where your, or the framework is instantiating your modules. It's setting up the module injector. There is view creation, um, when we're actually creating the DOM for your entire application, instantiating directives, that kind of thing. And then there's uh, change detection, and this is when we're checking your binding values and updating them if necessary. Uh, the first part is really the module bootstrap part of application bootstrap. And the second two parts are more related to the component tree. Um, and today, we're going to talk only about the component bootstrap portion, just for time purposes. Um, but you can always answer questions about module bootstrap after. Um, so in the course of you know, explaining how all this works, we have an example application that um, we're going to be going through. And this is my cat's personal website, or what I imagine it would look like. Um, and so it has you know, an image of my cat on the left. There's a header. There's an info card on the right that has all his information. And then there's a footer component that's actually you know, like scrolled beneath this uh, viewport that's his contact information. Um, so that's the app that we'll be using. And you could imagine it, its code might look something like this. It has an app module. It has a few components. There's one for the, you know, the root component. There's an info card component. And then there's a footer component. And then in the root component template, you can see you know, some of the things that I just showed you. Right? There's the image of the cat. There's the header. Um, there's the info card. And there's the footer. Um, so 
when we bootstrap this application, we're going to start um, with whatever component you put in the bootstrap property of your ng module. So the framework will start looking at app component. And there's a few special things that we have to do at the very beginning to set up your root component. The first thing that we need to do is locate your root element. So when you wrote your index.html, you added some tag, right, like app root, and then it should match whatever selector that you have in your root component. So the framework needs to figure out where this element is so it can you know, bootstrap your Angular application inside it and append all the elements to it. Um, so when you compile this component, uh, the selector gets compiled into the definition, so we still have that information. So the framework just takes this selector from your component definition and you know, document.query selector that selector, um, and that's how we can locate through elements. So that's pretty straightforward. Next, we want to actually create an instance of your root component. And again, this is something that the component definition makes pretty simple. Um, the, you know, com the compiler generates a factory function that tells us how to correctly create this component with any dependencies that it may have. So in this case, there's no dependencies, so it's pretty straightforward. You're just newing it. Um, but we just call the factory function to get that started. And um, then we're ready to actually start rendering the root component. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Um, so view creation. So we're starting the process of you know, creating the DOM and instantiating directives. And this is where the template function comes in. So you'll recall that your HTML template is turned into a function. Um, so all you need to do, or all the framework needs to do, is invoke this template function and um, give it a particular mode, so in this case, creation mode. And as soon as that function is invoked, it will create the DOM correctly for that component. Um, so if you imagine this as your component tree for our application, right? we have you know, the app, the info card, and the footer. Um, we can invoke the template function in creation mode to create the app component. Then we can invoke the template function for the info card to create the info card component, and then do the same for the footer. So really, if we want to create an entire application, or the DOM for an entire application, all we have to do is call all of these template functions in our component tree. Um, so what is a template function? Um, a template function is a function that is composed of a number of instructions. And when I say instruction, what I mean is it's like an Angular, it's a function that is implemented by the Angular framework that does some specialized piece of work. So you can roughly divide them into two camps. There's creation instructions, which you, know, you may have guessed, it creates, they create things. Um, and usually it's indicated by the name. So the element instruction creates an element, text instruction creates a text node, the projection instruction creates an ng content. You, know, you can kind of guess where this is going. Um, and the update instructions will take an existing you know, element or component or something, and it will update it. So you know, the property instruction updates a property, the attribute instruction updates an attribute. Once again, it's pretty, um, pretty self-explanatory in the name. And what instructions are actually generated in your template function depend on what you've actually put in your HTML template that you've written. So if we go to the app components template here that we were just looking at, the compiler would generate something like this, this equivalent template function. Um, and right now, we're just kind of uh, focused on the top part, right, because we're in creation mode. So let's start by explaining um, how all of this works. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that the structure of your template function is really mirroring the structure of your HTML template. You see that we have an image tag on the right, has a source attribute. And then in the element instruction, we're passing in that tag name for image. We're passing in the source attribute. Um, so they're, they're really similar. And we do that on purpose so that it's easy for us to create the exact DOM that you wrote in your template. Um, because we're not actually just taking the you know, the template string, it's not HTML, we're not just inner HTMLing it. We're actually creating all of these elements one by one, um, which is what these instructions do. So if we took a closer look at the element instructor, instruction, um, we would take the tag name that you give us, and we use really recognizable DOM APIs that you've probably used before, like document.createElement, pass in the tag name, um, get whatever parent is the right one for right now, which would be the root element in this case, set any attributes that you set, and then just append the element that we just created to its parent. So it's all much more straightforward than I think you might expect from um, what's inside this function. 
We also do uh, one more thing, and that's we track all of the elements as we're creating them. So we store them in our own internal data array. And the reason that we do this is because later in change detection, we're going to be um, updating these elements, right? And so we're going to need some way to get access to them. So we could use DOM APIs, right, like query selector to get a hold of them, but that can be pretty expensive and pretty slow. So instead, we have our own way of keeping track of these elements so that um, it's fast for us to access them later. Um, the internal data array where we store these elements is something that we call an L view. Um, it's also known as a logical view. And we create an L view instance for every template instance or every component instance. So every component has its own you know, set of storage that has its DOM elements inside it. So in addition to DOM elements, we also put things like binding values in here so we can check old binding values against new binding values. Uh, we also put directive instances in here so that we can set inputs on them later. Um, so yeah, every component has its own you know, source of data. And so for creation mode, what we're doing is we're you know, going through and we're adding each element as you create it into this array. So if we go back to our template and we imagine that we're, you know, we're executing it line by line, we'll create this image tag, um, we append it in the correct place, and then we'll store it in our L view here on the bottom right. Then we'll create the H1, we'll append it, we'll store it in our L view. We'll do the same for the info card and the footer. There's one more thing that these element and text, or really just element instructions are doing, and that's directive matching. Um, so at compile time, uh, the compiler will analyze your ng modules and your component decorator, and it'll figure out, based on your ng modules, what directives and components are available to your component in its, you know, in its module scope. And once it knows what all those directives are, it'll print out that list of directives inside the component def definition. So here for the app component, it has access to the info card directive or components and the footer component. And this makes it um, much easier for us because at runtime, um, the runtime doesn't have to worry about you know, module scope or any of that stuff. We, we know what our list of available directives is from the component de definition. Um, so if I put the registry up here on the right so you can kind of visualize it, as we're creating all of these elements, we're also matching directives against the elements that we're creating. So for this image tag, we'll, we'll look at the registry, look at the first item, which is info card. We'll grab its definition, look at its selector, right? And then we'll try to see if the image tag matches the info card selector. They don't match, so we'll keep looking, checking to see if the image tag matches the footer selector. Still won't match. And we'll keep going through as we're creating until we actually get a match. And at this point, we need to actually instantiate the, you know, the directive or component that we found. So your first thought might be, oh, you know, the framework should just call new on whatever type it is, and then you're done. Um, but that doesn't really take into account dependency injection. Uh, any of these components or directives could have any number of parameters that could be anywhere in the tree. Um, and so what we do is we instead call the components factory. And this is the same factory function that we you know, invoked at the very beginning. Um, so if you look at what info card's factory function would look like, um, it'll call new on info card, as you might expect. But it also has this, uh, this directive inject instruction. And this is the instruction that powers dependency injection. So this is the thing that's actually going to go get this info token that you've, that you've asked for. Um, and you know, dependency injection is kind of its own talk, but the gist of it is that the directive inject instruction will take the token, and it will first check the directive injector tree. Um, the directive injector is where uh, we keep track of all of those providers that you added on directive definitions and component definitions, as well as the directives and components themselves. Um, so every time you have a node that has directives on it, we create a directive injector. Um, so it becomes this, you know, this big tree of directive injectors as you walk up kind of the DOM. Um, so we'll look at you know, the directive injector for the node that's closest to where we're requesting it, and then we'll keep walking up all the way to root. Um, and if it's not there, then we fall, back, oops, we fall back to the module injector. The module injector is where we keep track of providers that you set on uh, ng modules. And if we don't find it in the module injector, then you know, you're out of luck and we'll return null or something, depending on if it's optional. 
Okay, so for this info service provider in our example app, let's say that we provided it on the app module. So when we're creating the info card, you know, we call Directive Inject, and Directive Inject will first check the node that we're currently on. So it'll check the info card node. And it'll, it'll try to see, okay, is there a Directive Injector here? Yes or no? Is there, an, is there a Directive that's registering info service as a provider? No, there isn't. Um, so then we'll move up to the next parent element that has a Directive Injector, which is going to be the app root element, with, which the app component is on. Um, did the app component provide info service? No, it didn't. So that's when we fall back to the module injector, take a look to see if it's been provided, and it has, so we're very happy, and um, we can correctly create the info card directive with the info card service, or I think it's just called info. Um, so as soon as we create the info card instance, we're going to want to save it in that same LVU array. And like I mentioned earlier, we need to keep track of directive ins instances so that we can set inputs on them later, and also so that we can call lifecycle hooks with the correct context. There's a lot of things we do with directives, so we have to keep track of them. Um, then, of course, since you can compose multiple directives on the same node, we'll also check the rest of the directives in the registry after that. Um, so we'll also match the footer later and you know, add it to the same array. Um, so one thing that you might be thinking is, this directive matching process seems super expensive. You know, your directive registry is probably more than two directives, right? It's normally, you know, most of common module, right? You've got NGF, NG4, you have all your imported modules, you might have material, and that's very true. Um, and so directive matching is not something that we want to do more than once per component. We want to do it the very first time we see a component, and then we never want to do it again. So how do we make that work? Um, well, essentially, we make that work through shared data structures. So I've already mentioned um, the L view and how we create one per component instance. We also have a T view or a template view, and we create one of these per template function or per component type, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, so for example, if you have a, com a component that has 10 instances, you would create 10 L views and one T view, and all of the instances would share the T view. Um, and the way that we make this work is that we store the T view on the component def. Um, so the next time we create this component instance, we can look at the def, look up the T view, and, and look at all the information that we stored the first time around and make use of that. So in practice, it might you know, be something like this. We have all of our elements in our L view. We have our directive instances. And as we're pushing directive instances into the L view, we're also pushing their definitions into the T view at the same index. Um, Similarly, as we're creating DOM elements, we're also pushing uh, template nodes into the T view at the same index. And template nodes, or T nodes, um, are essentially just kind of metadata about each DOM element. So it'll create, uh, contain information like the tag name, um, or more importantly, in this case, information about directive matching. So on the T node, we'll have a list of directive indices or a range of directive indices um, that match this node. So for info card, for example, the second time we go through uh, this app component template, we'll get to the info card element, we'll check to see if there's a T node at that instance that we already created. The T node will have information about where the directives are stored for this node, and it'll point to the definition, and then we can just go ahead and instantiate it immediately without having to do any matching. So it, it makes it really quick for subsequent component instances. Um, okay, so I mean, that pretty much takes us through view creation for a single component, but as we mentioned, we're going to be doing this for every single component, so just imagine the same process for info card and footer. Which brings us to change detection. Change detection, once again, is the process where we uh, check all of our binding values, and if they've changed, we re-render the view to reflect the updated values. As you may have guessed, it's a it's very similar to view creation in that we can just go ahead and invoke all the template functions down the component tree, but instead of using the creation flag, this time we can just use the update flag. So if you call all these template functions top to bottom, then that's change detection, essentially. So now we're going to focus on this second half of the template function now that we've explained the first half. Um, and this is what we'll execute when you're in update mode. Um, so again, the first thing I want to draw attention to is how similar these, uh, these two things are. If you have your template on the right and your template function on the left, 
Uh, there's you know, the header binding, you can see that in both places, and then below that there's the name binding, you kind of see, see them one to one. Um, however, we're no longer creating elements, right? So we're not necessarily going to have a one to one mapping for every element. Um, there'll be some elements that have multiple bindings, there'll be some elements that have no bindings. Um, so to keep track of which element we're on when we're you know, generating our binding instructions, we also have these advanced instructions. Um, and these kind of tell us how to negotiate between nodes and bindings. So this is much easier to visualize if you kind of can see the data structures. So on the right here, imagine this is the L view. This is the array where we've been storing our elements. And um, these you know, 0 through 6 are the, in, the index, indexes or indices of um, the L view. And we're going to need to keep track of two things. Um, one is the current node. So this is the node that we are currently on, the node that we actually want to update the properties for. And then there's the current binding. The current binding keeps track of um, where we are in the L view. It's a better way to explain that. Um, so basically, we need to keep track of all of the old values of bindings so that every time you run change detection, we can tell whether it's changed, right? So the old binding values we will save in this section of the array after the DOM elements. Um, so uh, we'll have kind of a counter that keeps track of where we are in that section of the, of the array as well. And you'll see how that works in a second. OK. So let's say we execute the first advanced instruction. Um, all this does is tell us that the first binding is two nodes down. So it'll say, hey, increment the current node counter um, until you get to the node that's two nodes below wherever I am. So now we're on the text node. And then we run the text interpolate instruction. Um, and all this does basically is it checks the header variable that you passed in, so context.header, against whatever value you have at the current binding index, which is right now, it's empty. So the first time, we just assume that the values have changed. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and update that text binding um, in the DOM. And we'll also cache the value for the next time that we run change detection. And then we'll increment it so we don't keep overwriting the same value. Um, so we're done with bindings on the current node, right? So we advance one. And that tells the framework that the next binding is on a node one slot down, which takes us to the info card. And then we execute the property binding instruction. And that says, hey, for whatever node you're on right now, um, you want to check the name property and you know, use the value that I'm passing in, so the name value. And again, it's the first time, so we assume it's changed. Um, so we'll want to update uh, the binding value here. But you'll notice that this is a directive input, right? This is not an element. So we don't want to go and set the name property on the element. We want to set it on the info card component. Um, but you'll remember that we have this beautiful mapping between a certain node and all the directives on the node. So it's pretty simple for us to you know, extrapolate which component this is and set the inputs on it directly from there. So the next time that you go through change detection, we'll be checking against these values that we just saved. So whatever the new value of header is, we'll be checking it against Hermes the cat. And then whatever the new value of, prop, of you know, name is, we'll be checking against Sherlock Holmes. Um, OK, so one thing that you might have noticed is that uh, change detection is going to be running within a view from top to bottom, right? Because we're keeping the ordering as we you know, mirror the template. The component tree is checked from top to bottom, and uh, all the nodes within a component view are also checked from top to bottom. So it's pretty predictable. So if you had this template you know, with the div and the text binding, you know, like one, two, three, four, um, you can expect it's just going to be executed in the same order that you see, one, two, three, four. That's the order that the, like, the bindings will actually be set. Before Ivy, in View Engine, this was actually slightly different. Um, I don't know if you guys can guess what the order would be right now. Just like, think about it in your head. OK. Is this what you thought? Three, four, one, two? OK. Um, so the reason for this is that pre-Ivy, we would do two separate passes. We do one full pass for directive inputs, and then another full pass for element and text bindings. So in practice, you know, it, it makes sense from an implementation standpoint, but from a user perspective, that's super confusing, right? You wouldn't expect it to happen in a different order than you see. Um, so that's one thing that we've fixed in Ivy, is we've made it a lot more predictable how your template function is actually going to run, or how your template's going to be checked. But one thing I want to call out is that 
while we would guarantee the binding order between nodes, we don't guarantee binding order within a particular node. And there's a really good reason for this, and it's essentially to reserve the right to optimize bindings within, within a node. Um, so for example, let's say we have this component, it has a bunch of property bindings, has a bunch of attribute bindings. Um, we could just generate something like this in your template function, right? Where we have um, an instruction for every binding in the same order that you wrote it, just like as you might expect. However, it's pretty duplicative, right? You have two property instructions, you have two attribute instructions. Um, is there any way that we could optimize this? And we can using property chaining. So if we can kind of fudge the order a little bit within a node and move them around, we can take the property binding from below and we can chain it on the property binding at the top. And we can do this because the property instruction returns itself. So the function is returning an instance of itself. And so we can keep chaining you know, properties and attributes and save those extra function, uh, function names in the code size. So this might seem like a micro-optimization, and it is, but over large templates, it actually makes a big difference. So this is the kind of thing that we like to do. OK. Oh, yes, I have time. OK, so one thing I, I haven't talked about yet is lifecycle hooks. You might be wondering, when do these happen? Um, and they actually execute as part of change detection. I just kind of omitted it for simplicity. But now we're going to go back and kind of you know, enrich what we had before. So. Uh, you are probably familiar with lifecycle hooks, but I'll do a quick review. So um, the first three, ng on changes, ng on init, and ng do check, these are all hooks that have to run after the inputs are set for a particular directive. After view init and after view checked, usually happen after the view, or always <laughs> happen after the view is checked. Um, and then after content init and after content checked, happen after you know, content children are checked. Um, but what you may not know is that they actually execute slightly differently. So these first three hooks, we execute node by node. So we'll run them like one node at a time, whereas um, the other ones, we run view by view. So we'll run all of them at once for a view instead of all of, all of them at once for just a particular node. Um, and what that means is that all of the node by node ones, the on changes, the on init, and do check, we have to actually run while we're executing the template function, because that's when we're, you know, that's when we're actually evaluating the nodes. Um, so if we go back through the lovely process, um, all the lifecycle hooks are being executed in this advanced instruction. So in addition to changing the, uh, the, you know, the cursor for the current node, we're also executing lifecycle hooks. So here, um, as soon as the advanced instruction runs, we know that we're done with all of the inputs and all of the bindings for that node, right? That's how we know that we can advance. Um, so for this one, in advance, we would say, hey, there's no more bindings for node 0 or node 1. That's why we're moving. So we can execute all the lifecycle hooks for node 0 and 1. Um, so then we you know, move, the, move the cursor like we did before. We you know, check the binding for the text binding, update the value like we did before. Um, and then we get to the next advanced instruction. And at this point, we're done with all of the bindings for the text node. Um, obviously, this doesn't work. We're not going to have any lifecycle hooks for the text node, but if we if this had been like a normal element, this is where we would, you know, flush any lifecycle hooks for that node. Um, so let me check the last instruction, um, and then at the end, there's no more advanced instructions because we're done, right? Um, so after the template function is invoked, we just execute any of the lifecycle hooks that remain for things that don't have bindings. Um, so after the template function uh, runs, we actually do a few more things. Uh, one thing is that we refresh your embedded views. These are um, all of your ng templates that are, have been added through something like ngif or ng4. I really wanted to talk about that today, but I don't have time. Come find me. Um, then we flush all the content hooks. So remember I said content hooks and view hooks happen node by no or happen view by view. So this is where we flush all the content hooks at once for a particular view. Um, we set host bindings. We check any of your child components. So once again, we're calling the template function for any of the child components in the tree. And afterwards is when we flush all of the view hooks. And view hooks are bottom up, so we have to check the child components first. Um, so hopefully by now you have a better understanding of what you're seeing here, right? We've kind of gone through all of these instructions. Um, so hopefully this isn't as scary. Uh, just as like a quick review of what we've seen. <laughs> Um, in view creation, we created some elements, we set up some attributes, 
We didn't have any listeners, but that's where we would have registered them. Um, we matched directives, we instantiated directives, we performed DI, we created our child components. Um, in change detection, we checked all of our bindings, we called lifecycle hooks, we refreshed embedded views, we checked our host bindings, and we checked our child components. So there's a lot going on, um, but hopefully that's a little bit more digestible than it was before. Thanks. <laughs>
But you may have already noticed, there's a bit of a bug here. By not cleaning up that subscription, I've actually got a bit of a memory leak. So I need to go back in, refactor the code, capture the subscription as well, and make sure that I'm unsubscribing from it in the onDestroy lifecycle hook. So once I finally got it all working in terms of making it easy to use this value in my template, I go to actually run the application, and then something crashes, and I end up with stack traces like this that are just ridiculously long, mostly because, well, Zone.js is interplaying in a weird way with RxJS, making it hard to debug what's going wrong. So I kind of want to know, could we provide a better experience for reactive programmers who are trying to author Angular components? And I want to challenge you to help me build this. So let's take a look at how we can maybe solve this as if we were all open source authors trying to launch a new library. But first, my name is Mike Ryan. You can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, and Median at Mike Ryan Dev. I'm a software architect at an IoT company called Synapse based in the United States. I'm a Google developer expert in Angular and web technologies. And I'm also one of the co-creators of the NGRX project, a collection of open source libraries trying to bring reactivity to the Angular framework. So my goals for improving reactivity in Angular are this. I want to make it so that developers can use observable values easily in their template. But I also don't want them to have any accidental memory leaks. I don't want developers to have to think about managing subscriptions. And I kind of want to give developers the opportunity to build Angular applications without Zone.js to maybe improve debuggability or performance. Now, when I start to build an open source library, I'm a big top-down designer. I like to think about, well, what would my users want to use? What would be a good experience for them? So to sort of sh share some of my ideas about this API, I have to talk briefly about how change detection works. When you've got a tree of Angular components that comprise your application and something interesting happens in them, one of those components might become something called dirty. It means it needs to be updated to the view. Angular is then going to go through this tree of components from the top down, and it's going to find any components that are dirty and actually update those views for us. So where do zones come into play with this? Well, interestingly, zones don't actually have much to do with the change detection mechanism itself. Zones just tell Angular when to actually run change detection. Zones are going to patch all the asynchronous APIs in the browser, and when your code interacts with one of those APIs, that will cause change detection to be triggered but this has a potential trade-off. First, it can potentially run change detection too often. If you're using a particularly noisy asynchronous API, like a WebSocket connection, you might incur a penalty because zones don't know that not every asynchronous operation needs to cause change detection to run. They also have the potential trade-off where it might cause change detection to be skipped. So if you're using a particularly obscure browser API that zones haven't actually patched, then you might be caught in a situation where your UI is not updating. So, open source designers, how can we go about trying to fix this? Well, I want to challenge you to really think and look around other ecosystems. As Angular developers, it can be really easy to sort of look within our own ecosystem and try to figure out how to solve this within those walls. But I like to really look into how other frameworks and technologies are trying to achieve some of these problems. So I'm going to do something kind of taboo. I'm going to put some React code on the screen and walk through a little bit of React for a second, because it actually solves this in a pretty interesting way. In React, you have this idea of component level state, the values that change. And when that state changes, the view gets updated. And as the author of a React component, you tell React exactly when that data updates. And what's really interesting about this is that is how React knows when to run its own change detection, because the developer has told it that the underlying data has been updated. So there's some pretty interesting benefits to this approach. First, changes to state are what causes change detection to run, not asynchronous operations. This means that the developer has full control over when change detection actually runs, because they have control over state changes. This can make it a little easier to keep the UI consistent and up-to-date in a performance way, in a performance-sensitive way. So that's a pretty interesting approach. But if we were to try to do this in Angular, we'd have to overcome the problem that Angular doesn't have component-level state. We don't have a built-in, low-level state mechanism for our Angular components. But actually, maybe we do. If you're using something as simple and elegant as a subject with a service, or maybe something more complex like NGRX, 
then as an Angular developer, you know that you're actually tracking state with observables. Observables are the mechanism by which we track changes to our data. So if I want to try and design a way to do this better at the component level, I kind of want to borrow from both. So let's imagine instead that we had some kind of like hook in Angular to handle our change detection in our components for us. Whereas component authors, we'd say this is the kind of state this component has, and we can call into some kind of connect hook where we pass in a dictionary of observables that will subscribe to those observables and actually update our components for us. Then from there, we could take that state and use it inside of our templates without having to worry about the async pipe or multiple subscriptions. So how can we go about actually building this? Well, first, we're going to need a demo app. As an open source library developer like yourself, you're going to need something to actually tinker with and play around with. And I want this demo app to actually use Ivy, because there's a few interesting things that Ivy is going to give us when we actually go to try and build this. First, Ivy is going to enable us to build something called higher order components. We'll get into those in a minute, but the idea is that we'll be able to inject custom behavior into our Angular components. Ivy also has new change detection APIs that will make it just a little bit easier to work without Zone.js. And since we're talking about binding state into our template, it's going to be really great that Ivy is going to give us improved type safety in our template. So let me show you the example app that I have built dozens of times when I've tinkered. It's just a simple counter. It has one number, and you can add, add a number to it or add a, a subtract a number from it. But it's a really helpful demo app because it demonstrates two things, state and changes to state. And you can author it inside of a single Angular component. So this is how I've built my example app. I have two buttons that push values into a subject, either a negative one or a positive one, depending on which button you've pressed. And then I'm going to take that stream of values, and I'm going to use the scan operator to add that value to the, my starting number. So if I add a 1, it'll increment. If I add a negative 1, it'll decrement. Now I need to actually get this application working with Ivy and without zones. So how do I turn on Ivy? How do I get to Ivy? Well, it couldn't be easier than ever. All I need to do is run the ng-update command, passing in the next tag for both Angular Core and Angular CLI. This will update me to the early versions of Angular 9 where Ivy is turned on by default. And that's all I have to do. But to turn off zones, I have to do a few more things. First, I need to go into my polyfills file, and I need to find the line where I'm actually importing zone.js, and I need to comment it out. Then I need to go to my main.ts file, where I'm bootstrapping my application, and I need to let Angular know that I'm not actually going to be using zones in this application. Once I've done that, we can see the application has booted up, but when the user interacts with it, nothing is happening. Well, this makes sense. Since we haven't included zones anymore, there's nothing telling Angular when to run change detection. So that brings us to the first bit of Ivy API that we're going to use. We're going to use new change detection APIs that come with Ivy to try and trigger this. So traditionally, if we wanted to run change detection manually in our Angular applications, we would inject something called the change detector ref, and then we would call detect changes on it. And there are a few downsides to this. First, we had to actually inject it into the component that wanted to use it, which means that if we wanted to build functions or libraries to run change detection for us, the component would have to inject it itself and pass it to the library. It also had the downside where it might potentially cause the change detection to run multiple times synchronously within the same frame, yielding maybe a performance hit. In Ivy, it gets a lot simpler. There's a function called markDirty where you pass it an instance of a component to run change detection on it. I don't need to inject anything into the component, and it's got some pretty interesting properties underneath the hood. To play with it, we can actually just open up the console in our Chrome developer tools and get at the component instance. From there, I can call some method on that component instance to cause state to change, and then I can use the ng probe to mark that component instance as dirty, which will cause change detection to run. But if we're going to build our library on top of this, we need to sort of understand what it's doing underneath the hood so that we avoid any potential gotchas. So what does Mark Dirty really do? How does this work in an IV application? Well, the function signature is pretty simple. We're just going to pass in an instance of the component. Then Angular is going to do something called, it's going to get that a component view for that instance. Now, this component view data has enough information in it 
for Angular to go ahead and mark that view as dirty, meaning that when change detection runs, this component will now be checked and its, update, and its bindings will be updated. Mark view dirty returns to us something called the root view. Now we saw earlier that change detection runs on a tree of components. Root view is really just pointing to the top of that tree, the top of that tree element. From there, mark dirty is gonna do something called schedule tick, and it's gonna pass in a root context and a flag to run. So what is root context? Well, root context has information about how our Angular application is meant to run. And for change detection, there's two parts of it that we want to pay attention to. The first is a scheduler function. The scheduler is going to be responsible for making sure that some amount of work happens after everyone has scheduled work to be done. The second is the flags. Flags tells the root context what work will be done when the scheduler fires. So if we go back to our schedule tick, we can start to unpack what this is doing a little bit. By passing in the root context, and a root context flag, it is instructing Angular that, hey, you need to do some work at some point in the future, and the work you need to do specifically is you need to detect changes on the Angular application. And this means that this function can be called safely multiple times without causing change detection run multiple times. So now that we know how to use it, we can start using it inside of our components. So if we go to our component definition, first we need to actually import mark dirty. And this is where I've got some bad news for you. Mark dirty, even in Angular 9, is not a stable API. So it's got a theta prefix indicating to us that we shouldn't build production software on top of it. But for this demo, we can start to play with it a little bit by using the import as syntax. Then I can use the tap operator to call mark dirty on the instance of my component. This will cause change detection to run on this app component. Now if I run my app, Things are working. I've got Ivy, and I don't have zone.js, and yet my application is updating live. But I don't want to call Mark Dirty myself. I know that if I ask my team to remember to call Mark Dirty, including myself, we're all going to forget to do it sometimes. So I want some other piece of code to be responsible for calling this for me. And that's where higher order components come in. Now here's something interesting about them. I don't actually know how, as a community, we're going to build higher order components yet. It's so early, this idea of bringing higher order components into Angular, that it could be built with inheritance, decorators, or functions. I'm not sure, and I'm really curious to see how this shakes out. For this demo, though, we'll build them with inheritance. And the idea is that we're going to modify the behavior of our components, change something about the way they run, or render, or how change detection works. And what's great about them is they can call new IV APIs like Mark Dirty on our behalf. So if we go back to my API design where I had this connect hook, I could actually build this using a higher order component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class called Reactive Component that everyone will extend if they want to get this behavior. When you extend it, you get access to a member method called connect that you can pass in that dictionary of observables to and will cause state to update live. So this is how our API is actually going to work in an Angular app. But like, how do we actually build this? That doesn't seem particularly clear how we'd go build this connect method. So aspiring open source library author, let me tell you, if you're going to publish an open source library for Angular and you don't get the types right, you will have nothing but issues for years. It turns out Angular developers really like it when our libraries are well typed and they don't have to work around the type definitions that come with your library. So if we want to get the types right, we need to leverage inference. And here, we can see this is what the user is going to provide to us. They're going to provide us an interface that matches something like this. And we need to be able to infer, using a special type, the result that looks like this. And to do that, we can use a type alias. Here I've created one called Observable Dictionary. And it's going to be using TypeScript's mapped types feature to actually do this inference for us. So this be a kind of complex type, so let's break it down piece by piece. If we start with the following state definition, we're going to first use the key of operator to get every key in that input type. Then we're going to iterate over each of these property names to map into a new object type. From there, we could index the original type to get that original value. So now we've rebuilt that original value up. 
And now we can nest it inside the generic parameter of the observable type, allowing us to get from that original type to the inferred one for the observable dictionary. So that gets us our types all in place. Everything will infer correctly. Now we need to actually implement this connect method. So we'll start by creating what I'm going to call a sync. As we subscribe to values, we're going to dump them inside of this sync. And to get at those values, first we have to enumerate over all of the keys inside of the dictionary. I'm going to build an observable from these keys, and then I'm going to take every one of these keys, and I'm going to look up that original observable that the user passed in. When that observable updates, I'm going to write that new value to my sync. To get this all running, I'm going to subscribe to this observable that I've built up. And when any value changes, I'm going to go ahead and call mark dirty, which will run change detection on my Angular component. It looks a little complex, so let's break it down what it's really doing. Let's say you pass in a dictionary that looks like this, where I've got a, an observable of vegetables. What this will do is it's going to subscribe to that observable, and whenever a value changes, it's going to update that value inside of my sync, allowing me to use that value directly in my template. So now that we have an implementation, we can go back to our component, and we can now go ahead and remove the import to mark dirty, and instead extend our new higher order component. Now that we're extending reactive component, we have access to these state values, and the subscriptions are being managed for us. So we can go back to our template now, we can rip out the async pipe, and we can just use state.count directly. Everything's looking really great. But I go on the application, and something's broken. What's gone wrong? So I open up my console, and I've got this really long error. And it's something like cannot read property node index of undefined, and I don't really know what that means. But when I look at the second line, I see something familiar, get component view by instance. Well, hey, I remember when we were calling that in Mark Dirty. Angular calls this as part of us trying to run change detection. So what is this really doing? Well, the way Ivy kind of works at a very, very high level is it's going to first instantiate an instance of our component. Then it's going to create our component view for us. And then it'll call our, the on init lifecycle hook. So if we go look at the definition for that connect method again, the problem happens to be at this line. We're calling mark dirty on the instance of our component before the component's actually been initialized. So we need to use lifecycle hooks in our higher order component. How do we do this? How can a higher order component get access to lifecycle hooks? Well, it turns out it's fairly straightforward. All we have to do is implement the lifecycle hook, and Angular will call it for us. But I don't want this in the format of a callback. I actually want to turn this into an observable so that I can compose this in my streams and offer observable lifecycle hooks to anyone using this higher order component. So I'm going to do that by initializing a subject, just a simple replay subject. And when ng on init gets called, I'm going to next a value into it. Could be any value. And I'm going to mark the subject as complete to let any subscriber know that lifecycle hook has been called and won't be called again. But library author, let me tell you that if you expose something like this, your users will break it. So we need to hide some of these implementation details. To do that, I'm going to hide some of these properties behind symbols. That way, uh, consumers of this higher order component can't actually get at these properties other than the on init observable. I'm going to do the same for ng on destroy. So now I've got observable forms of on init and on destroy. And I can go back to that update sync observable, and I can make some updates to it to make this actually work correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the concat observable factory. And I'm going to pass in on init first, and then update sync. This will ensure that on init has actually run and has completed before I try to update my sync values. Then I'm going to use the take and tell operator on it. And I'm going to pass in the on destroy lifecycle hook that I've created. This means that the subscription will be automatically cleaned up for me when this component is destroyed. Finally, I'm going to subscribe to this observable, and I'm going to mark the instance as dirty. So now if I run my application, and I either hit, hit either of the buttons, values are updating live. I've got change detection running for me automatically. I don't have to use the async pipe in my template. 
subscriptions are guaranteed not to, link, not to leak because the higher order component is managing those for me. And if I do something more complex, like I'm using subjects with a service, then I can leverage this higher order component to connect to that state management offering. Or if I'm using NGRX, I can take those observables that NGRX is giving me, and I can use the connect method on those too. And in fact, libraries like NGRX and NGXS and Akita could take this idea one step further, and they could offer their own higher order components that remove a ton of boilerplate that we have to write when connecting up our components to state management solutions. So now that we've built Reactive Component, we've achieved a lot of goals we set out to do. Developers that use Reactive Component can use values directly in the view without the async pipe. It's easier than ever to not leak memory accidentally because we're no longer responsible for managing subscriptions. And this makes it possible for us to build entire Angular applications without zones by leveraging the idea that all of us use observables to track state changes. So maybe you're wondering, how can I use Reactive Component? Can I run out and use it now? And the answer is, unfortunately, no. Because like I said at the beginning, I need your help to build this. I'm really excited to announce a new initiative on the NGRX team called NGRX Component. It's a library coming directly from the NGRX team to make building Reactive Components easier than ever. It's very early days, but our idea is to build this on top of some of the new APIs that are coming out with Ivy. And we want you to get involved to help us make this library really fantastic. To jumpstart you, here's a link to the slides, along with all the code demos that I've showed in this deck. You can actually run this application live and start playing with this idea now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Uh, wow, these are great ideas, and I really hope that you um, implement them. And uh, uh, this is your opportunity to help the community and uh, contribute to open source projects. Um, we're gonna, we have a few more minutes before the next talk. So uh, in the meantime, you're again um, rem uh, reminded to Submit your questions to the panel in slido.com. Um, log in with Angular Connect, and your questions will be asked in the panel.
Okay, wow, how are you all doing? <laughs> yeah, Angular Connect. Uh, oh my god, well, this is, I think, one of the last sessions, right? Um, and this day has been going so great and so much wonderful content, and uh, we've learned a lot of things. Um, so I want to remind you once again to submit your questions to the panel through slido.com. Everything that you're asking there is going to be considered to be asked to the panel. <laughs> um, but we've had some great questions uh, last time, last year, um, some interesting things, uh, new point of views. So please do this. We want to hear you. Our next speaker is Sam Julien, and he's a developer advocate engineer at Auth0. And also, for the 5% of you who are still using Ang AngularJS, he's the creator of the course UpgradingAngularJS.com. And uh, in his free time, he enjoys also hiking and camping, especially in Portland, where he also runs the Angular community there. So please give a hand to Sam Julien. Let's see. Am I on? Can you hear me? OK, awesome. Yeah, so last session of the day. Whew. I think they put me on as like some entertainment. I'm not quite Sony levels of entertaining, but I'll at least like try to keep you happy in the last session. Um, hopefully, you've gotten a deep breath after all the IV stuff that you've learned. So we're going to talk about facades today. And facades can be a little controversial. You might have heard different people talking about them, whizzing around the community. Some people love facades. Frosty, who, who isn't here today for some reason, but Aaron Frosty runs ng-conf. He loves facades. He thinks it's a pain to have to inject the store into components. Some people, like a certain someone sitting in the front row who just gave a talk, are a little bit less keen on facades, a little more skeptical on them. And then I'm sure there's a chunk of you out there who are just sitting there thinking, like, what the heck is a facade? What is, what is this word that you keep saying? So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to go through and explain what facades are, and we're going to look at the pros and cons of facades, and whether you should use them, and we'll cover a lot of ground. So I'm Sam Julien, as Shmala said. You can follow me on Twitter at Sam Julien. I'm a developer advocate engineer, which is a fancy word for developer relations at Auth0. Uh, I'm a GDE and an Angular collaborator. I created UpgradingAngularJS.com. I'm also an author at Thinkster.io. I'm about to come out with a course on Gatsby, the static site generator that uses React. Uh, I know. Uh, React and GraphQL. Uh, so I'm going to be coming out with that shortly. Uh, so I mentioned Auth0. We uh, provide an authentication and authorization service for developers. It's simple but extensible, and it's got a real focus on the developer experience. I also live on a small organic farm, so these are my 19 chickens. Uh, and these are my two llamas, Michelle and Barry Olama. <laughs> so it, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's Barry over there, and then that's Michelle. It's not showing. Oh, well. But Barry's on the left. Uh, and so if you follow me on Twitter, you'll get a lot of chicken and llama content on there. Follow me for the, the chicken and llama content. That's the good stuff. So first and foremost, what the heck is a facade? Like, what do, what do I even mean when I talk about a facade? Well, this is a very famous facade in your neck of the woods, uh, Buckingham Palace. There's another famous facade in your area. This is 2223 Linster Gardens. The building on the left is real, and the building on the right is fake. So if you turn or to go around to the other side, this is the back of the one that was on the right. It's actually a railroad tracks running through it. But, so this is, this is a type of facade. But this is sort of a facade in the way that we think of Instagram being a facade, right? Like, it's like people post these, like, beautiful pictures. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I had created this picture, but, but yeah. So, so this is sort of a type of facade. And we use it in sort of, like, common parlance, right? It hides away the messy things. And that's sort of what we mean. But when we talk about facades in code, we kind of more mean how your relationship with your car. So when you get into your car and you use your gear shift and your drive pedals, you don't have to think at all about like combustion and how the engine works and all the details 
of how the car goes forward. The car abstracts away all those details for you. So the car is sort of like acting like a facade for accelerating a vehicle. And that's sort of more what we mean when we talk about facades in code. So with code, usually when we're talking about facades, we're, we're using the facade pattern. And this is a, a pattern that was popularized in the book Design Patterns, which is sometimes referred to as the Gang of Four. So what is the facade pattern? What does that mean? Let's say that I have a client, and the client has to call three different services to go get some data, right? So we've got this class here. It's got a function called do something. And inside of that function, it's got to go call service A, and then call service B, and then call service C. And that's fine. That's great. You know, it's no, no problem there. Uh, but then your boss comes along, and your boss is like, you know, I think actually instead of service C, we really need to use service D. So you're like, okay, fine, did that, no problem. That's okay. But then a little bit later, it turns out that you need to replicate that exact same behavior in another part of the application. So now you have to keep track of this in two different places. And your boss comes along and is like, actually, you know what, it's not service D that we need, it's service E. So you're like, okay, fine, I change it there. And then you're like, oh, dang it, I forgot, I have to go change it over here too. And then a few months later, it turns out that there's another place that you have to replicate this same behavior, and on and on and on, and you just start losing track of where you're supposed to maintain this, this behavior. So this is where facades are actually really useful. So with facades, instead of having the client worry about service A, B, and C, we can insert this layer of abstraction between the client and the services. And this way, the client doesn't actually have to know anything about what is going on under the covers. So in our little general example here, we've got this client, and we can actually take this code and move it into its own class called a facade. And this facade now has a function called get everything, and get everything is containing all of those extra details of how the, the data is getting retrieved. And then in the client, we can actually just call the facade, call the get everything method on the facade. So this is really nice because then if we need to make some sort of changes, like if we need to change service C over to service D, we just do it in the facade and we don't have to worry about it anywhere else. Back in the client, we don't have to change anything. And if we're doing that same behavior multiple times, we don't have to change anything anywhere else. So this is great. What about facades in NGRX? What are we talking about there? So to explore that, I have good news for you. Mike made you all open source developers. Now you're all working for CERN, the uh, Council for uh, Nuclear Research in Switzerland. You're all now engineers for the Large Hadron Collider. Congratulations. That's your going away present from Angular Connect. And if you don't know what the Large Hadron Collider is, it's a particle accelerator that has these two beams of light, and they go super fast, almost at the speed of light, and collide. And the reason we're doing that is we're trying to find the Higgs boson particle. Now, the way this works is that there's this ring of magnets along that are cooled down to negative 271 degrees Celsius, colder than space, and that's how the particle beams are able to go so fast. So we've been in instructed to re-architect the software that runs the Large Hadron Collider. And as you might imagine, it's extremely sophisticated software. It looks like this. This is actually, if you go to the Large Hadron Collider website, this is actually the dashboard that you can see uh, to see the status of the Large Hadron Collider. It's called Vistars. This is another dashboard that's on the uh, Large Hadron Collider. So you can imagine this is a large, complex, event-driven application, right? You have to know the status of the beams, the temperature of the magnets, the status of the collider, all kinds of things. And when I think of large, complex, and event-driven, I think of NGRX. So we're going to use NGRX. You've probably seen this diagram. This is a really creaky floor. I don't know if you can hear it out there. But uh, you've probably seen this diagram. Me and Mike uh, gave a talk at NG Vikings that used the same diagram. And Mike uses it in pretty much every talk he gives about NGRX. I tried to get him to use this diagram in his Ivy talk, and for some reason, he wouldn't do it. But the NGRX architecture is famous for this indirection, where the view layer doesn't have to know anything about how state is changing. So let's think through how we might architect this application with NGRX. So first, let's think about changing state with actions. So with changing state, the components dispatch these actions through the store, and the actions travel through the effects and the reducers to change state. 
So for the Large Hadron Collider, we might have a whole host of actions. Just a few that we might think of are maybe the, the beam 1 status, the beam 2 status, the temperature of the magnets, and uh, maybe finding the Higgs boson particle at some point. That would be ideal, right? Uh, and the nice thing about actions is if we use them correctly, we should be able to go back to the log and see exactly where all of these actions came from. So then in our code, we could use the new action creators in NGRX8, and we could create an action like start beam 1. Perfect. So what about reading state? Well, we read state through selectors. So uh, the components can use a selector to read state from the store. So how would we do that in the Large Hadron Collider? We'd probably have a, a lot of different statuses to keep track of. So we might create selectors for the beam 1 status, the beam 2 status, the magnet temperature, the collider status, a lot of things that correspond to the actions that we're doing. And then in our code, we do things like store.select, and we'd have select beam 1 status. So let's look at our beam 1 component here. So in beam 1, we've got our constructor where we inject the store. We've got a turn on function, and in this turn on function, we dispatch an action to start beam 1. And then we have a selector for our beam 1 status. So this is all pretty standard, pretty straightforward NGRX. Uh, but some people are not super happy with this. Some people don't really like the store, the, the con component to know about the store. OK, fine. So where could we use facades to help this problem if we don't want the component to know about the store? We can actually do something similar with the facade pattern. So we've got our NGRX architecture here. So what we'll want to do is we'll want to insert a layer of abstraction between the store and the components. And that will be our facade. So what does this look like? Well, if we go back to our beam 1 component, we can extract a lot of this code into another class. This class is just a regular injectable. It's basically a service called beam 1 facade. And we'll use our store here in the constructor We'll move our turn on method over to the facade, and we'll move our selector over to the facade. And now, when we go back to our component, we're going to use the facade instead of the store. So we'll have a constructor where we inject the facade. We'll call the facade's turn on method, and we'll use the, the beam one status from the facade instead of the selector. We should have a drinking game or something where every time I say facade. Uh, <laughs> Not necessarily alcohol, just anything. Um, so the nice thing about this is that we can abstract away the, the implementation details of like the turn on method. So in the turn on method, maybe we need to change the action that we need to use, so we can just make that change in the facade, and then we don't have to make that change anywhere else. And so I know now you're thinking like, OK, this is awesome. Now the components don't need to know anything about the store. Facades are fantastic. Uh, this is everything I've ever wanted, and I'm going to go out and use it right now. But it's unfortunately not that simple. Um, there's a few things that we need to consider a little bit more carefully, and I want us to reason through this architecture decision here. So remember, one of the things that we said was the magic of the facade is that when we need to replicate code and use it elsewhere, we don't have to make those implementation details available everywhere. But if we think about NGRX, what's one of the staples of good action hygiene? It's that we don't reuse actions. Actions are meant to be unique. So if we go back and look at the actions we've decided to use, we have this namespace here, beam 1, beam 2, magnets, collider. And the idea of this is that someone going through the log, say years down the road, there's some bug that comes up, somebody can actually go through and know exactly where everything is happening. And that's one of the many reasons that we make actions unique. So you might be thinking, I don't think this is going to happen. So let's think through an example here. Let's say we're working on the collider component. Now, the collider has to know about both particle accelerator beams, right? So we think we know what we're doing. So we go ahead and inject the beam 1 facade and the beam 2 facade. And we're going to get super clever, and we're going to have a, an observable for beam 1 status, an observable for beam 2 status, and everything's good to go, right? And then, of course, you get that knock on your cubicle, and your boss comes by, and your boss is like, hey, buddy, 
Uh, can you just make one small change? It's going to be super easy. And you're like, all right, yeah, sure, I guess. And your boss is like, you know, it actually would make more sense if we could turn on the beams from the collider component and not just from the individual beam components. And you're like, OK, um, that, that seems pretty easy. Uh, I've already got both the facades here, so I think all I need to do is just slap in a new turn on beams function, call the turn on function of beam one and the turn on function of beam two, and everything's good to go, right? Like, that's boom, done, problem solved. And there's a small problem with this, though, because we're actually reusing those actions. If we think about this, if somebody runs that turn on beams function from the collider component, and some problem arises, and they go back and look at the log, this is a lie. This didn't actually happen. The, the, those, function, those actions, we have no idea whether those actions came from the beams or from the collider components. And that's a big problem. That defeats a lot of the purpose of NGRX. So another problem is if we look at this a little carefully, this looks suspiciously like reusing things as services, which again kind of defeats the purpose of the indirection of the NGRX architecture and the Redux pattern. We're basically reusing pieces of state as services, and that's not really what we want. So if we were doing this without NGRX, or without facades, not without NGRX, if we were doing this with plain old NGRX, what would we do here? We would normally just create a specific action for this situation, right? We would have a collider action type of start beams, and that's what we would dispatch to the store. And then from there, we would have an effect, and this effect would listen for that start beams action and probably call out to some API, some fancy CERN API that turns on the beams, right? And then we'd have our reducer, and the reducer would listen for that start beams action, and the reducer would update the, the state in the UI. And then, instead of seeing something like this on the log with two different action types here, we would see one action type, and we'd have the collider namespace, and we'd know that we were starting both those beams, and we'd know exactly what was happening here. And in doing this, we're letting effects and reducers manage state, and that's what we want, right? So if we still want to use facades, if somebody out there is like, no, we still want to use facades, we can still do this, right? But if we go back to our facade here, the main issue with this is this turn on function, because what we've done is abstract away actions. And this is the dangerous part. So what we need to do is instead just have a generic dispatch function on the facade. And that way, the components will just dispatch the action through the facade to the store. And now we're using facades, but we haven't defeated the purpose of the NGRX architecture. Now remember, we, we had a little bit of a problem with the way this is set up, because it, it's sort of suspiciously like using service architecture again. So what are we going to do about that? Well, there's another thing that we can refactor that'll make this a little bit more obvious. So if you remember, we were using various selectors in our facades, and we were being really clever about it. We had our collider component, and we had the beam one status and the beam two status. Everything seems great with that. But then your boss comes by again. Hey, buddy. It's always that. It's always got to be hey, buddy, right? Like, hey, pal, right? Um, I just have one more thing that I need you to do. Just like super easy, real quick, no big deal. But it turns out that we actually want to know the status of both beams before we can turn on the Large Hadron Collider. So we need a Boolean that's a combination of the two beams, because we only want it to return true if both the beams are on. So you're like, all right, well, this is easy, right? I've already got the two facades. I've already got the two selectors. So I'm just going to do something super easy, slap in a new observable. I'm going to use combined latest, and I've got my two beam statuses, and I've got a map function that's just going to return a Boolean of the combined ones. Easy, right? Done. But there's another problem here. We've actually just introduced a performance bug by doing this. And it's subtle, and it's not obvious. But if we look at combined latest, where we pass in the two observables, and then we have this mapping function, that mapping function is going to run more times than you think it will. So let's look at the marble diagram of combined latest. So with combined latest, the top observable is going to emit A. The second observable is going to emit 1, and as soon as it does, combined latest will emit A1. 
And then when the top observable emits B, combined latest will emit B2, B1. And then when the second observable emits 2, combined latest will emit B2. So that combined latest runs any time there's a value for either of them. So there's an, actually an extra instance of that mapping function that's going to run. So that mapping function is going to run more often than you want it to, which is going to cause some performance problems, because you don't actually need it to run any time either value changes. So how do we fix this but still use facades? Well, I've got really good news for you, because the NGRX team already thought of this, and that's what create selector is for. So with create selector, we can actually compose together selectors to compose together pieces of state that we want to keep track of. So we can use select beam one status and select beam two status, our selectors that we created before. And we can use our mapping function to return a Boolean value of the combined values. And now we don't have any performance problems. So now if we go back and we think about our service architecture versus NGRX Redux architecture, it becomes a little bit more clear. Because what we should have done is had a specific collider facade. And this collider facade would keep track of everything that only the collider needs. So we'd have our store injected in the constructor. And we'd have our dispatch action that we covered earlier in the talk. And this time, we'd have our combined status observable. That's the selector that we've created to compose together those pieces of state without messing with our performance. And then if we needed other selectors, like we needed to keep track of the magnet status or the magnet temperature or something, we could add that to the collider facade. That's no big deal. Or we could just keep it the way it is. But now we're using facades in a way that doesn't sacrifice the power or the, or the performance of NGRX. So back in our collider component, we would use the collider facade in the constructor. And we'd have our turn on beams function that we can dispatch that unique action of turn beams on. And then we could use that combined status observable off the facade. And now we're using the facades in a way that uh, works with NGRX just fine. So facades can make your life easier, which is awesome. But there's a little bit of nuance to how they're used in order to use them correctly. Because the thing to keep in mind is that the power of NGRX actually lies in the architecture. So we go back and look at our NGRX diagram again, our famous or infamous NGRX diagram, where we have components, effects, and reducers. We want to make sure that we're changing state with actions that are unique. We want the components to dispatch those actions and have them route through the effects and reducers to change state. And then we use our selectors to read state from the store. So it is possible to use NGRX with facades by inserting a layer of abstraction between the uh, store and the components. But we have to do so in a little bit of a nuanced way. And this reminds me of something that one of my favorite teachers in computer science, uh, Sandy Metz, says, which is to pr prefer duplication over the wrong abstraction. So it's really easy when you're getting started with NGRX to get a little overwhelmed with perhaps the boilerplate, sorry, Brandon, uh, it feels like you're writing a lot of code at first. And this facades pattern kind of seems like a welcome relief from doing that. So it's really tempting to jump to facades really quickly. But if you do it too quickly, you're actually choosing the wrong abstraction if you implement it naively. Kent Dodds has another way of saying this, which is avoid hasty abstractions. So you really want to think through the architecture decision before you just naively implement facades though it is possible to do so in a way that's still compliant with NGRX performance and power. So the issue here is that it's sort of like you've spent all this time to craft this beautiful staircase of NGRX architecture, and then you sort of decide, like, you know what? Up at the top, I'm just going like, to jump through a hole in the floor in order to get back down instead of going down the staircase. So to conclude, I'm going to use the voice of reason himself, Brandon. Uh, oh, no, that's in a minute. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> to conclude, if you're going to use facades, first and foremost, don't abstract away your actions. And secondly, make sure that you use create selector to compose your state and don't try to hand roll your own observables. And now I'm going to refer to Brandon Roberts and say, if you're, if you're learning NGRX to manage state, don't jump to facades too quickly because you're going to lose a bunch of time. So first and foremost, learn how the machine, the 
smartly implement facades from there. So you can find the slides uh, as well as an article I wrote for the Auth0 blog on facades. Uh, it has its own sample code and all of that. Uh, and also, of course, you can always feel free to either come up to me, ask me questions about NGRX or authentication or upgrading or llamas or chickens. And uh, that's basically it. So thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam Julien. Uh, so we're going out on a break now, half an hour before the panel. Don't forget to submit your questions to the panel through slido.com. So we'll be back in quarter to four, back here. See you later, everybody.
Sie. Hey. Hier, hier. Hier.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Let's hear it. I can't actually see you, so let's hear you. Are you there? Okay, so we've managed to get to the end of Angular Connect. But just before we go, we've got a few things, including the Angular panel. They're all there waiting to come on stage. But prizes. I haven't actually got a clicker, so someone else is going to have to click for me. Okay, so we've been asking you to tweet over the last couple of days. And we now can, very excitedly, announce the sponsor prizes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm not, I'm not really prepared, am I? Okay, sponsor prizes. So, let's hear it for Progress Sponsor Prize winner, Lucas. Woo! I don't know where you are, but congratulations. And Narwhal's Sponsor Prize winner, Domus. Have I pronounced it right? Hopefully. Domus, congratulations. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Twitter winners, I think. Yes. So, here's our first two. Jamie, so apparently you've been saving that T-shirt for a long time. Well done. You have won not another T-shirt, but a prize. Come and get it from the front. Megan's here. Let's hear it. So if you've been in the lift at all this um, couple of days, you might have noticed Bonnie doing some selfies. And so to recognize that, Bonnie, come up. You've got a prize. There's a whole collection of these, so you should have a look on Twitter. OK, next slide. It's coming. Next slide. <laughs> Okay, and up next, Tracy. Thank you for all the tweets you've been doing. Come and get a prize. And she's not here. She's probably tweeting somewhere. And finally, Danielle, thank you for tweeting. Come and get a prize. Okay, and Yes, I think up next is our top tweeter with the exciting prize of a free ticket to Angular 2020. Clark, where are you? Come on, we can clap louder than that. Oh, he's not even here. No? Okay, well, well done. And we'll see you next year. We'll email you. We'll email you. Okay. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> you could have, but we didn't do that. OK. So last night, we had some lightning talks, which I'm sure some of you attended. And we really enjoyed this lightning talk. So we thought we'd spend just five minutes, and we're counting, five minutes, for Jo to deliver her, uh, the lightning talk from last night. So Jo is a non-binary senior engineer with Narwhal. She has a fascination with the intersection of beauty and complexity, which has led to exploring education through performance and poetry. So please put your hands together for Joe. You've got that. Yeah, I need this. I need this. I'm not mic'd up otherwise. Hello. Um, first things first, Andrew, the stenographer. I am so sorry. Try and keep up. <laughs> I'm sorry for that as well. A is for Angular, the reason we're here. There's quite a lot to it, not all of it clear. What I'm going to attempt is poetic oration of Angular aspects that cause consternation. A few things have changed in the last time I spoke, but not quite so much. What I wrote is revoked. There's still much to say, so I haven't much time, but I've got 26 letters to get through in rhyme. B is for browser, for which we all build. There isn't just one. We may need, we may need polyfills, and I know this is something that causes us pain. Why do we do this? What's the ultimate gain? We test different systems as much as we're able, so as not to exclude anyone from our table. C is for core, where we find content child compiler as well, which each module provides. Common we need, as the name might suggest, and component fixture with which we write tests. D 
these for decorators, what are they for? They make classes and methods and properties do more. How do we add such syntactical sweetness? They're just functions that bring some grammatical neatness. D is also for loading our apps differentially. The more modern browsers will load preferentially bundles with sizes that weigh so much less. How it's all done, I don't know, I confess. E is for elements, exciting and new portable Angular components for you. Not only easier to load on the fly, but standards compliant, they're consumable by the other big frameworks, even plain JavaScript. They'll be fun getting future big projects to ship. F is for formats and factories and forms, driven by templates, are as reactive the norm. This is one of those areas where preference feels muddled, and it seems like it could leave developers troubled. Each approach has their pluses, neither is lesser, but it's worth looking up control value accessor. Under G, we find guards and some methods that get from protecting our roots to locale de date format. The methods are more or less simple enough, but explaining the route and guards would be tough. With the time rushing onward, I won't even try. If I have to use more sketchy rhymes, I might cry. H is for HTTP and our host. Hypertext transport is something that most of the devs in this room will probably get, but you may not have used the host decorator yet. It tells the injector just where it should cease as it tries to acquire what it needs piece by piece. I is for Ivy, or render a three, simpler and faster and smaller as a flea, or that's the intention. It's not quite yet done, but it's out there to try if you want to have fun. After Angular 9, getting near, so it's said, what feature will gain all the focus instead? J brings us on to JIT Compiler Factory, about which the docs are quite unsatisfactory. There's JSON Pipe 2, which I'm sure we've all used, but as it's impure, it should not be abused. It's great for debugging, seeing under the skin of the components we write and the properties within. K is for key values, using the map for detecting the changes throughout our app. This has left many devs feeling hopelessly wrecked as they look up expression changed after it has been checked. L is location, the way we might tell the parts of our app from each URL. The strategy used changes how the address of our pages will look and whether the mess with its readable straightforward slashes and slugs will instead of all that be just hashes and bugs. M is for modules and messages and mocks. While the module is one of the main building blocks, the message must may not be something you found. It sends data between the UI and background. Well, the webbook of code isn't perfect just yet. Its importance will grow in the future, I bet. Navigation is next, and the nowhere is schema. Of course, all the classes beginning NG star. Who'd have thought that the devs of modern creation would succumb to the need for Hungarian notation? Onwards to O for on init, on destroy, the decorator's optional and output. Oh joy, there's nothing that seems unfamiliar here, just parts of the system we hold near and dear. P is for plural, a curious thing. If you look up the rules for outputting strings, the, the Unicode CLDR has the specs for the locales your users might reasonably expect. I don't recommend it for a light bedtime read, but for localization, it's a doc you should heed. Q is for querying, all of the things we can query with types or query with strings. We can query the content, query the view, and be sure we update it if anything new. To observe all the things, we need RxJS, and there's more to this lib than might, some docs might suggest. If you're struggling with state and try NGRx, you'll learn more of its breadth, and at first be perplexed how you ever could limit yourself to subscriptions that ended with only a single emission. With S, we might like to consider schematics. For workflow improvements, they could be dramatic, but only if what we are hoping to gain is a better approach to the code we maintain. Pragmatically, projects that stay fairly small may not have a need for schematics at all. T is for TypeScript, not as hard as you thought, although lately it seems there's a war being fought between those of us pleased with our explicit typing and others who seem to be constantly sniping that JavaScript really was made to be free and guessing what everything does is the key. U brings the upgrade module into sight and I honestly can't recommend that you fight with the hybridization of Angular apps, separate them by root, don't fall into the traps of thinking that as this is something we could, that means it is one of the things that we should. V brings us round to view child and view children, view content, RF and view encapsulation. I really can't fit into here what they do, but note the distinction between content and view. There's a DOM for the things that we view on the screen and another for content that sets up the screens. W brings us to classes that look as though they all start with the phrase, what the f... <laughs> the, the intent here is not just to make you all smirk. WTF stands for Web Tracing Framework. If performance is key, this may be what you're using, but for everyone else, we see code that's amusing. X is for XHR factory, and well, what else is there under this letter to tell? They've wrapped XML HTTP requests. It's one of the things that allows us to test. Why is for you, all the people here seated, who wrestle with code and remain undefeated, community is something that makes us all better. And frankly, there's nothing that starts with this letter. Z is for zones about which all I'll say is I'm hoping we no longer need them one day. And that little thought is the last thing I'll mention. I'm grateful you lasted the course, paid attention. I've rushed through a lot in a very short time, and I think now I've used all my Angular rhymes. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Joe. So just remember, we have recorded that. So if you want to play it back in half speed or quarter speed to actually, you know, then you can do that. But that was amazing. Thank you so much. So uh, without further ado, can I invite the Angular team up to stage and we'll get started with the Angular panel. Thank you. 
Everyone got a seat? Okay, so let's hear it for the Angular team panel. Okay, so I just want to thank everyone for submitting questions. You may have seen us playing around with a bit. That's because there were duplicates. We also don't necessarily have time for all the questions. But um, hopefully we've got a good selection to interest you. And thank you very much for submitting them. Okay, so I'm going to start with a more general question. So, this is for each of you. What can we do as a community to help you? Who's going to start? If you're a library maintainer, then you should upload your project to Minko's repository. I've forgotten the URL, but if you were uh, around during the week and uh, during this week, then you would know what it is. Go and look on the videos uh, and make sure that it builds with and works with NGCC because that's going to then help the rest of the community and all of the people who use your library uh, make the transition to Ivy much cleaner. That repo has been moved to the Angular organization, so it's easier to find now. Yeah, but even more generally, just uh, checking out Ivy, um, testing your application, and finding any issues if you come across uh, any problems now would help us so that we have uh, less stress after the, the main release. Speaking of issues, <laughs> uh, when you write an issue, make it as simple as possible and explain specifically what do I click on, what do you expect, what should actually happen? Because a lot of times I look at issues and I'm like, I have no idea what you're trying to say. Uh, so assume I'm an idiot, that's a pretty good assumption, and go from there. Like, the simpler, the better. Like, if your stack blitz has a folder with a bunch of components in it, you've gone too far. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, this was for all of you. Uh, I would say if you maintain a library, just uh, kind of feel the responsibility toward the, the community. Uh, so like, um, like make it useful, but also make it right and like profile it. It's just like many people rely on your work to have like a good time. So just, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so to continue on what Mishko said, it's very important that if you have a bug uh, to provide a reproduction Small uh, reproduction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tiny. W Did the, I mention the, small? The, the minimal code needed to reproduce your problem. Uh, and if you don't actually provide a reproduction in, like, in a Git or stack blitz, uh, just in code, always provide the version of what your node version is, your CLI, your framework, etc. Because you might be reporting an issue that it was fixed in a patch version that was just released. Uh, so for me, if you want to contribute to Angular, I would highly recommend uh, going through the uh, pull requests uh, because it allows you to see um, basically what a certain change needs uh, for the, the code that's behind that, which really helps in understanding what needs to be done for getting stuff uh, changed. Um, so that would be it for me. Um, I already answered about the Ivy. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll let others talk. All right. Um, I'll just add on to uh, what we just say. Uh, we have more than a million developers. Uh, you can count how many of us are here on the stage. So be engaged, be involved with the community. Uh, if Go and help other people on issues, on Twitter or whatever. You see somebody else who's newer than you in the community, become the local leader, do a meetup. Basically, uh, the only way to scale to a million people is if we have thousands of experts below and thousands of below and so on. Yeah. Uh, and I want everyone in this room to try out Ivy, because there's a lot of us, and everyone on the live stream, because I think we can write some pretty crazy code and catch every possible edge case, so that no matter what we write in the future, it'll continue to work. Uh, yes, I, I think maybe some uh, documentation uh, help him uh, to write some documentation, even the example or some uh, exact usage will also help uh, the other users to use Angular better. Yeah. Yeah, so I think for me, again, the, the top uh, thing would be uh, uh, submitting issues and having good descriptions so that we can easily reproduce and uh, f find, locate where the, the, the issue is and fix it. Uh, but uh, also, what Jelly said, if you if you are looking to contribute to help, there are 
simple stuff that you can do, like fixing something in the docs that you read and you see a typo or a tiny thing. And even if it's if it seems tiny, it's a great help for us. So don't be afraid to uh, submit even a, a fix for a, a thing that you uh, that seems trivial. Tell us when something doesn't work. Clear instructions. Uh, minimum viable reproduction, like Mishko was also saying. Even better, please fix it and submit a PR. Rado actually kind of uh, touched on what I wanted to say, which is keep being awesome to each other. Um, I love being in the Angular community. You guys are some of, and girls are some of the most like fantastic, respectful, amazing people to work with. And it, it just, on a day-to-day -day basis for me, it's, it's really motivating to work on a framework that has such an amazing and loving community. So thank you all. Talk to each other. Oftentimes, engineering ends up getting overly focused on the technology and the choices and the, the code. But every time you open up and talk to someone and share your problems, share your successes, you're going to benefit from that. Are you saying they should connect? <laughs> and you are connect, yeah. You all took everything. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll, I'll extend on what was said about issues. Yes, minimum viable issue or reproduction of issues. And if we feel like it didn't quite like make sense to us and we ask for reproduction, please provide that reproduction. There are a lot of issues that get opened uh, and somebody is like, this problem's happening and here's why. And then we're like, well, we don't quite know. Can you like do this thing? And then we never hear back, um, which just leads to a lot of orphaned issues. So follow up on those things, I guess. I want to, of course, um, from a non-technical point of view, kind of include, uh, building on what uh, Stephen and some others said, uh, you can always try running an Angular conference, because uh, <laughs> that will help bring everyone together and, and, uh, and learn more about Angular. And if, if maybe that's a little bit too big a jump, then you could start by like running a meetup or going to a meetup and helping it and giving talks. So it's a lot about the community as well as just the, the technical things that you can do to help us as a team. Cool. OK. so. Just worth saying, we've had a lot of questions on this, which we've combined. So I18N, which is internalized isolation. nation. <laughs> What's the actual status about the Angular I18N implementation? Any update on runtime I18N? <laughs> <laughs> the buck stops here. No. Uh, so we've answered this question a couple of times at various points during the um, uh, during the day so um, apologies if I'm repeating myself but um, uh, internationalization is going to be an important part of uh, angular v9 um, we are putting in place the basic machinery to support um, a new pipeline for um, making translations faster and more um, versatile for you as developers uh, I'm not going to go into the detail but uh, the main point that you should take away is that we are going to be providing primitives which you will be able to build upon people in the community or maybe us within the team to add features. Uh, the difficulty about talking about runtime translation is it means a lot of things to lots of people. Like everyone I spoke to had a slightly different view on what it means. So um, we need to spec that out, work out what's appropriate for us to build and what's appropriate for the people in the community or even individual app developers to build. Uh, but our aim is to provide a basic level that you can uh, build upon uh, while still maintaining backward compatibility with uh, V8. It's a bit general, but this is a big panel. I, I would, I'm just going to add that. We really care about internationalization. And actually, in the keynote, I had like three slides all about internationalization. We were running over time, so I deleted them. And I've been regretting it for the last <laughs> two days because all the questions we got were about internationalization. So we care about it. Uh, it uh, we're going to be on par with what we have today in V9, but it's going to be much faster. And uh, we are designing in a way that will enable runtime uh, internationalization, but as Pete said, uh, there's more design work uh, before that is out. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit to it, which is that keep in mind that our uh, first step is to just replace what we already have, so all the new features will come later. So it's not that 
uh, we don't think runtime is important. It's just it's not strictly required to be backwards compatible with what IV, uh, what View Engine is. So that's why we're doing that thing first. And after that's done, we're going to do other things afterwards. Oh, and the last thing I'd say is um, uh, the conversations I've had in the last two days have been really informative for me being involved in the implementation of this stuff. So if any of you are regularly using internationalization and have a view on how you would like to be able to use it, then please get in touch with me. And I'd really appreciate your views because it will help us guide our future designs. Great. So we heard in the keynote about Ivy and the plans for when that was going to be released. The question is, what's up next? I, can, I guess I can take the one. Uh, <laughs> so in version 9, uh, it's all about enabling IV for applications. Version 10, enabling for libraries, and also starting to build up on the internal APIs that IV enables. Uh, I showed some of the examples of that in the keynote. Um, we have some exploratory work going on related to the server-side rendering and the hydration uh, of server-side rendered code. Um, many other experiments are going on. I don't want to go too much into details because we don't know, we don't want to commit to any particular features just yet. IV is still the number one priority uh, and getting that out is what we are focused on. So th that's the primary focus now. Cool. Where do you draw the line between useful performance optimizations versus unnecessary micro optimizations? Should I care about monomorphism in day-to-day -day development? <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, it's a complicated question. Um, I think the short answer is that in most cases when you write your application code, uh, you should make it to make it look uh, simple, uh, maintainable, um, and usually the VM does the right stuff. Now for something like a framework, we're in a little bit of a different boat uh, for a couple of reasons. One is usually we have to call into the application code and we call into the application code, we always call it from the same location. Like we have a piece of code that's responsible to call ng on in it. And so it is responsible to call everybody's ng on in it, which means that that particular call site becomes megamorphic. And so from our point of view, it matters what we do for optimization there. But it probably is not the same problems that you face as an application developer. So it's good to understand these things. It's good to kind of enlarge your understanding of how the VMs work and sometimes consider like, hey, something's behaving strangely. What could it be? Uh, so it's nice to have this kind of knowledge. But I would say for most cases in application development, this is just not an issue. It's a lot more interested to make sure that the code is simple, maintainable, first. Second is um, if something is not running fast, usually it's just some macro optimization that is off and you should focus on that la uh, first. And then micro-optimizations, such as uh, megamorphic calls and inlining, they do matter, but it usually only matters in super tight code, which just is running over and over. Like, for example, for us, it matters for change detection, right? Uh, it's rare that, that such code would be written by the application. Uh, it's possible, and so that's why it's useful to know, but it usually doesn't happen. Don't forget to measure and profile. Yes. Yes. Yeah, like, I, I think, like, if there would be, like, one advice is just open a profiler, like record the profile and have a look at it because most of the time there's like one or two like very obvious things that just jump at you. Like they are like literally screaming and saying like just go and fix me. And it's just like they, they don't have a chance because people just don't open a profiler. So like number one performance advice is actually measure. Okay, so it's been really interesting to hear during the conference about the inner workings of the Angular team. What was your motivation behind this transparency? Uh, transparency is very important. Uh, transparency also extends beyond code. Angular is a lot more than just code. So when you understand the internal workings of something um, and also understand the rationale behind some of the decisions and choices we make, uh, you tend to trust it more, you work with it better, and you become more productive. That was the motivation. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I would add, um, at least from from my perspective, uh, another part of it is demystifying how things work, so that it, it it's more approachable. If you actually understand the inner workings of our team, then our team doesn't seem scary. Um, I I worked on the components uh, sub team for a while before focusing more on framework stuff, and I was scared to submit anything to framework, and I sat next to everyone. So I can't imagine, or I can't imagine that for everyone else, it's got to be even more scary. So. 
making ourselves more, or making our project more approachable um, is definitely a goal of that. I also find it interesting when somebody sends a PR and says, why can't you just merge it? It takes you two seconds. And you go like, N actually, it does not. <laughs> merging takes two seconds. Everything before merging takes days. Well, the actual clicking the button, but like everything before and after and Google 3 and like all these pieces. So by understanding all these things, you know, you, it's easier to understand that there's, you know, things are not quite that simple as you think they are. Okay, so this question is for as many of you who want to answer it. What's your favorite Angular release and why? <laughs> I like um, at next because because <laughs> <laughs> you can just put that in your package JSON and then you're always on the latest Angular and you always have the best features. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong there. <laughs> why, why not at ma not at head or master? I'm not crazy. <laughs> But that's what Google uses. Yeah, yeah, we do test that it always builds an NPM package, so you should be good on master, actually. Maybe I'll take the leap. Yeah. For me, for me, it's the it's the releases we met along the way, made along the way, however that saying goes. I, I personally really liked 8.0, just because differential loading is, I think, really a fantastic manifestation of this idea that we can make Angular better by tweaking your apps and how they build and how they ship without you having to do anything that makes your apps better and delivers better user experiences. I think if we could do that in every release, make your apps better and not have to change anything, we would, we're going to do that. Hey. And to get a little bit sentimental, my favorite release is 0 0.10.12. Because this was when I first started using AngularJS, and it's like when I first started interacting with the Angular team and meeting these guys, and you know, Aww. I'm really upset. No, it's been a wonderful experience, and like that was the moment when I joined the joined the parade. So it's been fantastic ever since. For me, it's the one that we already released because that's when like all the work is done and people get to enjoy uh, what we've done. Um, but if I had to call one out, I think V6 was pretty cool because that's when ng update came out and that really made it much easier for people to stay up to date. Is that it? No one's going to say the future one then where you get to delete all the... I love all my children. Oh. <laughs> Equally. So um, someone's commented that Angular material was hardly a topic. Can we get a status update? Sure. Uh, so uh, Angular components as a whole um, is mostly fo is heavily focused on uh, so is on creating. Uh, I'm blanking entirely on the name of them on testing harnesses. Sorry, uh, and then building those testing harnesses for the material components themselves, as well as uh, moving our material components on top of the materials design teams um, MDC components. Um, so that we can stay completely up to date what, with what the material design itself is. Um, I think that's that's the main focus um, that's been that's been happening for the team. Um, the, the reason why it wasn't specifically talked about is when we planned um, who was going to come here. I was on the components team, so I was going to do that. But now I'm focusing on Dev Infra, so we didn't have a components talk. <laughs> okay, fair enough. What advice would you give to a project team that's just about to start upgrading a medium-sized project from AngularJS version 1.7? Very specific. <laughs> oh, I guess I can answer some of this one. You want to take it? Oh. <laughs> uh, mostly because I, so I'm on AngularJS 1.6, so not 7, so there's a little difference between there. Uh, but at least the advice that helped my team the most is to plan out how the components interact with each other. So if you migrate them, at least from bottom up, there's a couple different approaches, but knowing what the dependencies are and really thinking of your project as a whole when you're going about migrating it, it helps reduce the burden at least halfway through saying, oh no, I messed it up, it's not a good order, and I made my life more complicated. Do you have more, George? 
So, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Ivy doesn't change anything in that regard, so it's not something that should uh, add extra work or something. And uh, we have we keep uh, working on ng upgrade and adding uh, small features that will make that work easier for you. And maybe uh, the work on ng upgrade has slowed down when, while the focus is on Ivy, but with Ivy up, uh, there will be more work on that. There has been some uh, changes that would make testing easier, like when you test services with some helpers. Uh, but other than that, uh, there's not something that hasn't been uh, mentioned before. And planning out and having like uh, your Angular JS application be in a good state, like writing the best Angular JS application that you can before you start the upgrade would make it a lot easier. Also, what I've seen uh, teams be successful with is convert the root of the application to Angular as soon as possible so that you can lazy load AngularJS uh, and, and, f and build most of the application, the main screens with Angular and the least frequently um, pages. You can then lazy load AngularJS, lazy load the rest of the application and still keep it running. Cool. So as speakers yourselves, what are some of your favorite blogs podcasts, or any other resources that you could share with us? That's open to anyone. <laughs> the te technical ones, or generally anything? Any, Whatever you want. <laughs> uh, we are I, I like a podcast conference. called The Partially Examined <laughs> Life. It's a philosophy oh, podcast. Yeah. Uh, my kids love Wow in the World. If you have kids, it's awesome. It's science done in a very humorous way, specifically targeting kids. Cool. But it's funny for adults too. For me, it would for me it would be uh, Angular in depth. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's an awesome uh, forum to learn about advanced Angular stuff. Uh, so uh, really, uh, I do uh, recommend you have go visit there. Uh, thanks, uh, Max. <laughs> Um, I would say Google Talks, especially ones that are focused on the um, brain science and psychology, and like it has like surprisingly, hu it had like surprisingly huge impact for me as the like for as a developer. You would say like it, you know, it's all about languages and frameworks, but like we've got our brain, we kind of need to understand how it works. Um, so there are like excellent Google Talks on this. It it might sound silly, but Twitter. Like I know it's old and like it's probably going to be over in the next couple of years, but for now, web development is still very, very active on Twitter. So just ignore all of the trolls and just look for great articles and content that people are sharing. Yeah, I totally agree with Stephen that Twitter is a good source of information and to keep yourself up to date if you follow the right people. I really like to listen to NPR One, uh, which is a podcasting application that suggests podcasts from all around the world, and you get to be exposed to many different disciplines. It's you know not just of engineering; it can be um, you know psychology, whatever, and history. And I find, especially history, very fascinating. Uh, you know, there are so many things that happen for a reason, and we just see the artifacts now uh, and don't understand how it happened. So knowing why we are somewhere where we are and how certain things happen um, is very informative. Anyone else? No? Good. Cool. I like how you said things oh. happen for a reason, not things happen for good reasons. I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. we just avoided saying many of the uh, potential Angular related ones just because there's so many great ones out there that if we picked out too many individual ones it would be unrepresentative so um, that's probably why we all generally tended to steer onto the more general sides of things just to be safe. Fair enough. So other than Ivy what other features for version 9 is a team excited about? Uh, <laughs> 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 One of the features that I'm really excited about is the simplicity to build universal. Uh, so previously we had to call the server builder and then after the server builder there was another webpack built and now it's just one. So the server builder now can build your server TS and your whole server part. So one build does it well. 
Uh, we can also enable bundling of dependencies on server and hopefully coming soon, optimizations of JavaScript on the server as well. Yeah, most of the team was really focused on Ivy and Ivy is uh, the V9 primary feature. So there are smaller improvements. We're gonna improve dependencies, uh, update dependencies. So like TypeScript updates, RxJS updates, uh, stuff like that. But we're not working on any bigger features in V9 besides Ivy, because by Ivy is big enough by itself. So to keep on the components topic, we are adding two uh, components, the uh, YouTube player, the like uh, component that actually reaches in and does the YouTube iframe uh, ma like API management, as well as a Google Maps uh, component. Cool. Are you still working on improving the bundle size and performance? Yes. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> <laughs> I could expand on that, I guess. I, I yes, <laughs> we're <are> still, <laughs> we <are> still working. <laughs> They're like Y E S. So yes, we're still working on the the bundle size. Um, specifically, we want to look a bit more on more of our fixed costs. So one thing that Ivy already does extremely well is we've reduced our variable costs. So the code that we generate for you is much, much smaller than it used to be. Um, so now we're kind of going back and cleaning up. Because <laughs> uh, kind of a natural consequence of moving some of the logic to the runtime and by you know dividing all of our functionality up into more pieces with the instructions, you know naturally it's going to get a little bigger. So now we're kind of going back, you know, reviewing everything that we've done and trying to reduce the size of the framework. Um, that's going to improve it. You can also talk about your full work you did with gzip. Uh, we're also working on compression and making it compressible. I don't think they want to know the details. <laughs> cool. What tool would you suggest to use for end-to-end -end testing of an Angular application? So uh, as you probably know, Protractor is the default solution in CLI. Uh, this is because uh, web driver testing is the primary way to test applications at Google. Uh, we actually did a uh, deep dive into Cypress versus web driver testing for uh, uses in Google and determined that we cannot afford moving away from testing against real browsers just because we have so many mission critical applications that need to be tested on real browsers. Uh, if you don't know, Cypress is Chrome only for now uh, and unless that changes, we cannot uh, start using it. Uh, for internal purposes at Google. So we know that Cypress provides many benefits when it comes to uh, the open experience, speed, and some re reliability. So if, if you can afford testing only on one browser, you can install uh, Cypress into your project and start using it for end-to-end -end testing. Uh, if you want to test against real browsers, if that's your business requirement, then Protector and WebDriver are the best choices. Okay, so we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, is there a way to get custom decorators shakeable with Ivy? So repeat that? Oh, you want me to repeat it? Okay. Yeah. Is there a way to get custom decorators tree shakeable with Ivy? Ah, tree shakeable, okay. Um, it's probably not a great idea to be writing custom decorators right now. Uh, and the reason for that is because the spec is still evolving um, and may change a little bit before it lands in its final form. Um, the problem with tree shakeability and custom decorators is actually a problem at the language level. The way they have to be down leveled right now into both ES 2015 and ES 5 make it hard for the optimizers to kind of make good decisions around decorated classes. Uh, and part of it is just the fact that a decorator is almost by definition a side effect. Like it's, it's going to be changing the class and, and kind of doing operations based on, um, based on its implementation. So yeah, I would wait until the decorator spec is finalized and at that point the optimizing tools should get a little bit better at dealing with them. Um, there's not really much we can do in Angular to make that experience any better at the moment. Okay, and so our last question. Um, optimized runtime code inside Ivy is very interesting. Is it tuned for V8? Is it fast on IE or other browsers as well as Chrome? 
and try and keep that to five minutes, the answer. <laughs> well, I, I or less, you know, because <laughs> it's quite an easy question. So, so I, I will start, I think Mishko will add to it, but uh, it's definitely not tuned for V8, it's just, uh, I think that the performance tracking tools are like the best in Chrome, I guess, right now, and all the tooling around V8 is, um, is just the best, un unless like I am not aware of something. Um, so we, we, it's just like the easiest for us to understand what's going on inside the virtual machine using those tools. Um, but I believe that, that most of the optimizations that V8 is doing is that, like the principles are the same in all the browsers, like megamorphic calls will be slower in all the browsers. Um, so it, there, there is a possibility that like, you know, one artifact of our like um, of us using V8 as the primary tools uh, that we will ha do a specific optimization, which is like you know targeting V8. But I don't believe we should be slower in our other browsers. No, in, in general, these um, techniques that the VMs use are well known and they are used across, not just in JavaScript. They're used in Java or any other VM system that you happen to have. So this is not specific to even in language, not even a, a browser. So this is just a standard set of tricks that the VM authors use to deal with these particular problems. Thank you. So I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So can we hear it for the Angular team? And thank you very much for being so transparent. <laughs> Okay, so we're getting very close now to the end. Um, can I invite Pete and Ed to come back up? No? I think Ed's going to hide down there. Oh, okay then. <laughs> so, of course, uh, no, none of this could happen with lots, uh, lots and lots of help. And so I'm going to run through all, all the people that I thought of that we need to thank. If there's anyone I forgot, I'm really, really sorry. Come up and tell me, and I'll thank you personally afterwards. Um, so I think we're going to start a round of applause. Yeah, so I was That's just going to say, cover. we're taking a, a, a leaf out of Joe's book. I'm going to do this as fast as I possibly can, and you can help me by just clapping and cheering while I read all of this out, okay? So off we go. Right, 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 thank you. So all the staff at White October Events and the QE2 Center, uh, the Google team, our hosting team, Tracy, Alyssa, Bonnie, Schmueller, um, all our speakers and expert workshop givers and panelists, um, the NG Girls mentors, Dan and Sarah who played jazz last night, Erwin for doing mindfulness, White Cope captioning, thank you so much, AOTV did the live streaming, uh, On Productions who made all of this work, uh, and of course, finally, all of our sponsors who are on the stage all, all the way along here, especially AG Grid, thank you so much. And finally, of course, to all of you, you're amazing, keep up the good work, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Under five minutes. It's an absolute pleasure. And as they say, that's it, folks. Thanks for coming. So we look forward to seeing you next, next year. Uh, we'll be releasing the dates for the next year's conference in the, uh, very soon. So just keep an eye out on our website and our Twitter stream. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much for coming. Have a safe journey home. Thank you.